control commission is violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation of people with disabilities. Good morning, uh, everybody. Today is the second day of public hearing 19 of the Royal Commission. The subject of the hearing is measures taken by employers and regulators to respond to the systemic barriers to open employment for people with disability. I commence uh, by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose traditional lands Commissioner Ryan and I are sitting. I also acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, upon whose lands Commissioner Galbally is sitting. I pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also pay our respects to all First Nations people who are participating in or following this hearing. Yes, uh, Ms. East. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, and good morning to everyone following this broadcast. We'll start this morning with a panel of uh, two people, one representing the ACTU and the other representing the CPSU. So we have on the panel Mr Scott Conley from the ACT, ACTU and Melissa Donnelly from the CPSU Commissions. Yes, thank you. We'll wait uh, for them to come on the screen. While that's happening, you'll find a copy of Mr Conley's statement behind tab three in bundle A, and a copy of Miss Donnelly's statement at A19, and a submission document at A20. Yes, I think we have uh, Mr. Connolly and Ms. Donnelly on screen now. Thank you very much for uh, coming to the Royal Commission, motionally at least, in order to give evidence. Um, and we thank you for the statements that you have already provided. Just to let you know where we are all located, Commissioner Galbally is in Melbourne. Uh, I am in the Sydney hearing room of the Royal Commission together with Commissioner Ryan, who is on my right. Ms Eastman, Senior Counsel assisting the Royal Commission, is in the Sydney hearing room as well. And I'll now ask Ms Eastman to uh, ask you some questions. Thank you. Mr Connolly, can I start with you? You are Scott Connolly. I am. I just need the volume up a little bit. So we can hear you. Yes, I am. Is Thank that you. That's much better. Thank you. And you are the Assistant Secretary of the ACTU, and that's a position you've held since 2015. Uh, that's right, uh, Miss Eason. And you provided a statement to the Royal Commission, which was which has one annexure being uh, a recent ACTU policy. Are there any changes to that statement? Uh, no, Council, no. no. And the contents of the statement are true and correct? Uh, they are, yes. Ms Donnelly, can I turn to you? You are Melissa Donnelly. Yes. And you are the National Secretary of the Community and Public Sector Union, the CPSU. That's correct. And you've prepared a statement submission for the Royal Commission. Have you got a copy of that? Yes, I do. Are there any changes to the statement? No, thank you. And the contents are true and correct? Yes. So uh, I want to have a discussion with the two of you. And so the questions that I direct to you, I hope um, you both feel comfortable jumping in at the relevant points in time. But Mr Connolly, can I start with you? As you're aware, the Royal Commission is looking at the employment of people with disability in open employment. The Royal Commission will look um, next year, early next year, at segregated employment and the operation of the DES system. So I want to start with understanding what the ACTU does and the relevance of the work of the ACTU to people with disability. Uh, thanks, uh, Council. So I, I think the ACTU is the um, Australian Union Movement's peak uh, council, I, I think best describe us as the union uh, representative of the union. So our unions across the country, all of them, um, affiliate to the ACTU. And our role is really to provide a central gathering point um, uh, for the movement and a central uh, policy formulation point uh, for the movement. And of course, by extension, uh, the working people that are represented by our affiliates. Um, uh, some 37 or, or so um, across you know, industries uh, in this country and all of which 
um, have a direct exposure to and interest in both the labour market as it is and um, as uh, we would uh, like it to be in terms of both um, uh, areas of priority and reform and its, uh, its principal function in providing outcomes uh, for working families in terms of uh, their own um, life experience and then uh, economic um, assistance and benefit. Um, so that's our role in, in terms of its relation to this area. You know, clearly, um, you know, as organisations that have a commitment to you know, social justice, equity and equality fundamentally, it goes to our values as, uh, as unionists and as representatives of working people, the issue of uh, the rights of uh, people with disabilities to uh, function in the labour market, in the open labour market, in the context of this inquiry is critical uh, to our values and uh, something that absolutely aligns with um, our aspiration for uh, people uh, regardless of um, disability, um, other forms of disadvantage, etc. So we have an interest uh, in this area and the policy that we've been annexed to our my statement um, is a reflection of uh, those current aspirations uh, on behalf of the Australian Union Movement for People with Disability um, in the context of their interface with um, principally the labour market, but other policy areas, of course, because of the integration of um, you know, work with so many other areas uh, in our society. So I want to ask you some questions about some of the detail of the policy and how that policy has come about. But in addition to the union's role in developing policy, the union also has some special statutory functions in terms of being able to represent workers. So the representative functions include, for example, being able to take proceedings under the Fair Work Act. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we have um, uh, rights under the Act uh, to represent and you know, rights and obligations uh, to the extent of our, our obligations to represent people and act for uh, agents in relation to awards um, and representative functions in relation to both grievances um, on behalf of members, workers generally in the context of awards and then in the context of agreements that we might strike that are struck um, under the, the framework of the Act. If I put it this way, if we think about the uh, journey of employment, it starts at a recruitment phase, then it might move into the terms and conditions in employment and then it might be around the remedies and uh, circumstances of the termination of employment. From the union's perspective, you have a special role in relation to negotiating terms and conditions of employment in the work that you do in uh, assisting workers to negotiate enterprise agreements and collective working terms and conditions. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And then uh, where things might not go well in a workplace and there might be, for example, uh, allegations about breaches of the terms of an enterprise agreement or the Fair Work Act, or in some cases if a person might need assistance on a dismissal, then generally the unions have got both the role of providing advice to advocate for workers, but you may also have that function of representing workers in proceedings in the Fair Work Commission or the Federal Court. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, uh, Council. Um, and they're the functions that are central to the role of our affiliates and the ACTU's role in terms of supporting them in that in the performance of those duties. Um, so we can extend our work to you know, um, multiple um, yeah, cases where there's multiple unions of the ACTU might participate in but that are of significance to the movement. Um, yeah, similarly, well, we support, um, can provide support in terms of um, yeah, cases, be they individual or collective cases um, that are on foot or potentially on foot. And then, of course, the extension of that goes to, you know, what are the policies, what are the frameworks and how they might be, uh, be changed um, is part of our work as well. Now, uh, people may be unaware of this, and the commissioners have heard uh, during the course of the evidence yesterday about some concerns for people accessing their rights under the Disability Discrimination Act, and one of the issues raised was the standing to make complaints or who can commence litigation. The unions have a, a specific role in the Australian Human Rights Commission Act that the union, a union can lodge a complaint 
on behalf of another person. Is that right? That's my understanding, um, Council, that that's uh, one of our functions um, that you know, is used and has been used historically. And uh, I know you haven't addressed this directly in your uh, statement and you may not know, but are you aware of any of the unions affiliated with the ACTU who have used that standing function to make claims on behalf of workers in a range of discrimination areas, it might be sex, race, age, or disability discrimination. Is that something that you're aware of? And I know uh, I haven't asked you this before, so I'm springing this on you this morning. I'm happy, I'm aware of it, Council. I couldn't give you examples, um, top of mind. I know it's an area of uh, law when I was uh, engaged in an affiliate where I was actively um, involved in um, not necessarily the case, but preliminary work for cases. So, yes, it is an area of, um, of work that our affiliates do, and I'm aware that that is the case, absolutely. Right. Now, the last thing before I come to you, Ms Donnelly, is we, we asked both of you about the rates of employment within the union and union movement for people with disability. And, Mr Conley, you have said in your statement at paragraph 11 that you're aware that some persons identify as persons with disability, but you don't within the uh, organisation have an actual headcount of the number of people with disability working for the ACTU or broadly among the affiliates. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, uh, Council. It's not something that we've uh, measured or taken proactive steps uh, to measure. Is there any reason why that's the case? Uh, it, it just hasn't. I, I don't think there's a reason. I, I think in terms of uh, priorities, it hasn't been one that's been identified. I think for us, um, this is an issue that we um, yeah, advocate on, we support, um, we're conscious of developing our own um, um, action plan and have taken steps to do that previously. Uh, we've sort of worked with our affiliates in this area and really the, the, uh, us, us as an employer um, is a reflection, I think, of um, the labour market uh, broadly and our affiliates um, as well, where we have people with disability who previously had them working with us. But I think there's that disconnect between um, our policy work and advocacy work and you know, being an advocate and then um, at looking internally about how we might um, take steps. And I think our affiliates to some, probably to a large degree, um, are the same in terms of um, their 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 vehicles that um, represent largely uh, members of the labour market um, in employment. Uh, if we come in a moment to look at the new policy, would you uh, agree with this proposition that if the policy is going to work, then you need to start at home and to have the relevant headcount of the number of workers with disability who work within the union movement? Is that not right? I wouldn't disagree with that at all, uh, Councillor. Um, Ms Donnelly, can I turn to you? So as one of the members of the ACTU, your union has a, a particular role in relation to representing workers in the public sector, particularly the Australian public service, but also the territories, the ACT and the Northern Territory. Is that right? That's right. They are our main areas of coverage. And what can you tell the Royal Commission about the particular functions and role of the CPSU? Um, so our, our function as a trade union, um, we cover, as Councillor Sister indicated, um, members of the Australian Public Service, so primarily in federal government employment and the wider public sector at the federal level, as well as the territories and some areas of private sector employment. Uh, we represent our members um, through uh, bargaining and collective um, industrial issues in the workplace. Um, that usually occurs at the federal government level on an agency by agency basis. Uh, we also uh, represent and advocate um, for members on individual um, uh, grievance matters that may arise in their employment, um, either during the course of their employment or um, in some cases, of course, at the um, end of the employment if, it, if their circumstance leads to termination. And uh, does that work involve advocating for the rights of workers with disability? Yes, it does, Council Assisting. And does the CPSU uh, have 
uh, data internally of a headcount of the number of employees within the union, not who you represent, who are people identifying as people with disability? Uh, we do, Council. We um, have approximately 3.6% of our employees uh, identify as, as persons with a disability. Um, we have, over the last two years, um, done a lot of work as an organisation in terms of a range of um, uh, diversity groups. Um, so some of that reporting um, is relatively new and I suspect is under-reporting slightly just in terms of our ability to capture that data. So I want to turn to the first topic for both of you, which is the role of the unions in developing policy with respect to the employment of people with disability and just looking at that question of the terms and conditions of employment. So, Mr Conley, in your statement, you've addressed the role of Congress in terms of developing policy and the process of developing that policy. And you've also touched on the ACTU's role in looking at policy from an international perspective. So can I start with the international side? And you've addressed this at paragraph 19 if the commissioners are following the statement. And I raise this because at a recent hearing, the Royal Commission heard a little bit about the International Labour Organisation and the way in which international conventions setting out people's human rights have come from the International Labour Organisation with respect to employment. So the commissioners have touched on this topic and I thought it might be helpful just if you can address the matters as you've done in paragraph 19 about whether what is happening at an international level is something that influences the development of policy in the employment area for the ACTU. Um, yes, Council, uh, it, it does. So I think um, foundationally uh, sort of how we approach um, our priorities is sort of looking at, of course, you know, the fundamental you know, conventions to talk to, you know, the rights of labour, you know, to organise, to be represented, the conventions that relate to the rights um, that go to this area, you know, the right to... Um, uh, you know, the convention in relation to a disability and the freedoms that are associated in relation to that. And the, um, the ILO plays a, a critical uh, role in this area in terms of both, um, I guess, the steward and custodian of, of uh, these conventions. But equally, um, and in our context, I think there's sort of a, a global framework of rights, much like there is domestically a framework of rights for people in work, um, and we play a role um, both domestically as custodians and um, advocates. Uh, and similarly, we play that role internationally, providing um, a, a pathway to reflect what's happening domestically in the global uh, forum. And my statement goes to some examples where we've uh, made the case of our concerns with the domestic frameworks um, of rights in relation to the assessment tools um, the intersection of uh, the general protections and unfair dismissal rights for disabled workers, some of the social protections flaws and the employment service conventions. Um, my statement speaks to some of those examples where we, as part of our obligations and one of the functions of the ACT as a speak council for Australian unions is to represent um, our movement uh, globally, including at the ILO, and participate in those conventions um, on behalf of our movement. So you know, we participate in the, in the debate um, and equally report on behalf of Australian workers in the global context. Um, um, and we uh, don't apologise for our perspective that, um, you know, we, we wouldn't say that um, the domestic experience of the international conventions is, is um, satisfactory, and nor would we say that the international conventions are all they could be um, in this area or many other areas. Um, so it is an ongoing area of work and I note the evidence you alerted us to um, in a previous hearing that um, I think you know, speaks of an, um, some developing areas are here. Then, and I think one sort of reflection from us on this sort of part of our work is that it's just it, it's very um, slow, um, and yeah, you know, I think international negotiations and the complexity of trying to get consensus at the ILO to some degree as a reflection of that and equally our know, countries um, 
ratifying conventions and then making the decision to implement them invariably leads to some some gaps between the principle and its application, and we're no different um, in this regard and in some other areas. So just jumping in, uh, that the international conventions have been influential on the development of some industrial laws. If we go back, for example, to reforms back in the 1990s, that international conventions were often used to underpin the development of workers' rights protections. The ILO has been very significant in that. But I want to know if the union has also looked beyond the ILO. And so this Royal Commission, for example, is looking at the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we're thinking about how should that convention be better implemented in Australia? Is that a convention that's come on the ACTU's radar, particularly with respect to the way in which that convention deals with the rights of persons with disability in work and in employment? Only in a general sense, uh, Council, as one of the conventions to speak to the rights of workers. Um, so, you know, I think us taking forward um, an agenda pursuant to this right, you know, hasn't, hasn't been the case, but we're, of course, aware of it. It provides part of the, uh, the framework. And I think, um, you know, there's absolutely, you know, a, a piece of work about how do we um, use these conventions to advocate the cause and then, you know, how do you implement them? And, you know, I think the whole area of work here about the significance of these conventions um, is, is, is increasing, but I think it, there's sort of that reality about how are they applied domestically and for us, how do they intersect with the domestic framework um, and how do we see these laws are these conventions applied domestically and how do we enforce them and then how do they make a difference to people with disability or otherwise uh, in work? Um, so can I ask you now turning to a domestic framework? So you've told the Royal Commissioners in your statement about the process of Congress adopting policy and you've provided to the Royal Commission the ACTU Workers with Disability Policy so that's a, a policy that's been recently adopted, is that right? That's right, Council, yes. And um, in terms of the reasons for taking this approach set out in the policy, workers with disability, can you tell the Royal Commission how that came about? Uh, yes, so I guess our affiliates, um, part of our governance structure for uh, close to um, over 100 years or close to 100 years now has been to the Congress of our unions to convene. So that's how all our affiliates get together every three years and decide our policies and priorities for the preceding uh, three years. And in the... I'm sorry to jump in there. Um, rather than you are telling us the ins and outs of Congress, uh, yeah. perhaps can I get you to focus on why this policy at this time? So specific, putting this policy up. Well, I think for us, this is an area that... Um, is is a gap in our in our um, current framework, and we are not doing enough for uh, people with disability are in work and um, outside of work. So yeah, in that context, we have identified um, some years ago that this was an area that we needed to develop. We established a committee that did some work on both our own uh, employment practices spoke about previously, and then equally our movements practices. We know that some of our affiliates are more advanced than others in this area. Some have functioning um, uh, committees that go to you know, actively playing a role in this policy pace and the advocacy pace uh, for disabled workers. And the ACTU as a reflection of that, um, yeah, picked up that work um, and has put it in this context as a reflection of what the movement's priorities um, and principles are uh, for people with disability as a way of... Um, focusing our attention for the work um, going out of the Congress. So that's sort of... And were, were people with disability involved in the drafting and design of this policy? I, I, where that's been possible, uh, yes. So I guess in our context uh, previously, we've had an active committee um, at the ACTU. We convene a, a disabled workers committee um, that... Uh, it has included and does include, uh, to my knowledge, some uh, workers that would identify as disabled workers in the formulation of the policy. Our affiliates do the same and they come together and had, have had multiple discussions 
uh, about the policy and about its ownership. And you know, I guess we sort of try and ensure that I, I couldn't say it's all dis all people that identify with as disabled, but certainly um, they've participated in the process um, as best as that can be. And, uh, without going to the detail of the policy, it's got a combination of identifying policy reform areas. It's got aspects of amendments to the Fair Work Act, for example, to include in the national employment standards a minimum leave entitlement to support workers with disability, so adding to the other areas of leave in the um, NES. Uh, but it's also got some commitments in relation to representing workers with disability, including workers who acquire a disability in the course of their work. And so you've made some observations in this policy about the importance of superannuation, income insurance and support for injured workers. Would it be fair to say that this is a very ambitious policy in terms of all of the areas that have been identified? Uh I think it would be, um, like most of our policy uh, documents, they speak to the aspirations of our movement. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the reality for you know, uh, far too many workers in this country, their conditions um, need to be better. And you know, us as their advocates need to have those aspirations and a focus on advancing and advocating on their behalf. But it's no different for workers of disability. What, what are the uh, expectations in terms of taking this policy and the words on the paper into sort of seeing action? So what are your expectations and how are you going to measure whether you meet the expectations? Look, our work is, you know, is seeing, seeing how we implement the policy is at every opportunity. You know, this provides the, the framework for how we advance and advocate, you know, for um, this area of the ACTU's work, so if that is in our conversations in relation to amendments to the Fair Work Act, conversations in relation to supported employment or um, proceedings in relation to that, conversations with our affiliates or equally in both the global work we spoke about previously, how we interact um, with the ILO and the other um, global bodies that um, speak for, for workers or play that function, and then similarly, of course, with our Commonwealth government and state governments where the ACTU largely with the Commonwealth Government, but through our, our sister organisations in states um, have a regular interface uh, with policy and lawmakers. And this document um, is the basis for those engagements and our priorities in those interactions over the course of the next three years and how we'd assess its effectiveness will be a conversation um, and an assessment leading into our next Congress about where have we got. Um, Does it need to be something... Um a little bit more than a conversation if you go to assess the effectiveness of the policy? Do you have to have something concrete to be able to measure whether these policy objectives have been achieved? Look, I think um, a lot of these things are out of our control um, and as an advocate body we can advance these causes, um, make the case, but the decision makers um, here are to a very large degree our lawmakers um, in relation to amendments to the Fair Work Act, for example, um, those are uh, matters that will be decided by government and, of course, will participate in those uh, processes and advocate uh, the cause, but the decisions will be made by uh, the people sitting in uh, Canberra. Ms Donnelly, it might be opportune to, to turn to you now because one of uh, the areas of work where you've been involved from a policy perspective has been in supporting your members and understanding what your members are seeking by the Australian government's Australian Public Service Disability Employment Strategy 2020 to 2025. So that's a, a been a big area of work for your union over the last uh, couple of years. Is that right? Um, it, it has been an area that we have sought engagement directly with our members who identifies the disability and and I guess um, sought to um, through them and represent their views about what needs to happen in their own workplaces. And uh, in the preparations and for the development of the employment strategy, you did a survey of the members 
to get a sense of what the members identified as priority areas for a, a new national disability employment strategy. Is that right? That is right. And you've provided to the Royal Commission a copy of the submission that was made in relation to the development of the strategy and that identified a number of recommendations. That's correct. What were the sort of key areas coming out of the um, survey and the reason why you identified the particular recommendations? Do you want to speak about that? Yes, certainly. Um, so there were a range of um, uh, issues that were identified through this survey. We don't have, as a union, a uh, perfect data on disability disclosure. So the way we went about this was we put it out to all of our members and asked our people who identify as a person with a disability to participate. Um, there were a range of concerns that come out through that process. One is around the fact of disclosure. Um, there are lots of people who um, uh, have not or are uncomfortable identifying their disability to their agency for whom they work. And the reasons around that um, are that they uh, are concerned that they'll face discrimination of some, of some kind if they make that disclosure. There are a range of concerns um, about um, employment opportunities. And we did ask people specifically around their experience um, through uh, recruitment processes. Um, as a union, we would rarely, I guess, have the opportunity to represent people through recruitment processes, um, but we have had experience um, in some areas where, for example, there have been artificial barriers in our view in place that would restrict the opportunities um, around people with a disability. And the example I could give on that is the National Disability Insurance Agency um, advertising planner roles where um, being able to address uh, vehicle problems and being able to walk over uneven terrain were, um, were identified as requirements. So there were issues around recruitment. There were a large number of participants in our survey who um, experienced poor or very poor recruitment uh, practices. Um, there are issues around reasonable adjustment. This is an area where we um, do have more direct experience representing our members, um, uh, people who need obviously an, adjust an adjustment of some kind in their workplace. And it was of serious concern to us that um, less than 20% of the respondents to this survey indicated that had a positive experience in getting their reasonable adjustments um, uh, um, um, finalised with their agency. Um, there was also, I guess, a range of findings around representation of employees in more senior roles, um, the support or lack thereof, to be honest, um, from management for employees. Um, you know, some of the comments we got uh, through this process were included that, you know, in terms of support for staff with a disability, nothing happens unless you have the right line manager. So there are examples of people getting the support they need, but it really was um, the luck of the drawer about who your manager was and the particular outlook they look they had on those uh, processes. And there was, I guess, a concerning um, assessment of the people who participated in our survey about the capability of their management and senior management at, at um, uh, uh, addressing employment issues for people with a disability. So I think they were some of the key themes. So the, the strategy has been published and I might just uh, ask to come up on the screen the uh, graphs uh, and the infographics used in the policy. So this is the at first glance and I don't know if you can see that on the screen there. Ms Donnelly, can you see that? Uh, yes, I have it in front of me too. So. Okay, all right. So uh, looking at that in terms of understanding the Australian public service and um, just a bit of a profile of what our public service looks like. If we look at representation, the majority of employees are women at 60.3%. And this also gives us a sense of the mean age of employees, the representation of Indigenous Australians and the like. It also tells us the location of APS employees and the age, but I want you to just look at the classification. So looking at those classifications, that covers, in a sense, the way in which when people work for the APS, they're classified at particular levels 
and they may remain on that level for their career or they may move through the levels depending on the particular jobs that they might apply for at different points in time. I know I'm putting that in a very crude summary way, but do you, do you agree with that? Uh, yes, broadly. And one of the objectives of this policy or strategy is to achieve an outcome of 7% of the APS being workers who identify as workers with disability. Yes, that's correct. So we know from the statistics uh, available that, that the, at the current point in time, in terms of the data held by the APS, 4% of the APS are workers with disability. So we know that? That's correct. Right. And the objective of this policy is to achieve a rate of 7% by 2025. That's correct. Now, you have said in your statement with respect to the census, so this is the disclosure point, is that when people have responded to a census or a survey and they've disclosed a disability perhaps on an anonymous basis, the number of APS workers with disability may exceed 8% at the present point in time. Uh, yes, and I, we've, I guess, reached that conclusion based on um, the feedback we've had that people are not making the disclosures. So the data point um, for uh, measuring progress on this is, is uncertain. So if the objective of this strategy to 2025 is to achieve 7%, and the true figure is already 8%. Does that cause you some concern as to the um, overall objectives of this strategy? Um, it, it does, and that is why um, the issue of disclosure was one of the uh, points we have made in our submission to the APSC on this. Um, you know, we can't be certain that it's 8 percent but but the um from our survey which was not of course of the whole APS but th there is a clear gap between um uh, existence with disability and disclosure um and it would be unfortunate if this strategy um did not result in more employment of people with a disability but the only thing it achieved was addressing that disclosure addressing that disclosure in and of itself um, that disclosure gap would be a good thing but that doesn't change the um paradigm for people with a disability. Is the figure of 6,004 that is in the chart that is on the screen represent the 8.4 percent? That is um from that is the APSC's figure. Um, so that is of known disclosures. So that the 8.4 percent would then be uh, something like 12, 14,000. Potentially, yes. The strategy uh, identifies that the APS needs to employ an additional 1,600 workers with disability to achieve the 7%. I want you to turn to the next graph, which is page 13 of the strategy. And this is uh, described as APS employees who have shared their disability status by classification and then with the different colours, the colours to achieve 7%. So looking at this, if we uh, see across the bands, you can see, depending on the bands, APS1 up to SES3, that the different levels need to be addressed in different ways. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. Is that a fair interpretation of the graph? That is a fair interpretation. My understanding of the strategy that the government has adopted is that it's a universal 7%, um, but that, that is a, that there are different, differing gaps. That is definite. Right. So looking at um, the strategy overall, mm -hmm. SES3 is the highest level that you can achieve in the APS until you're outside the APS and you're into very, very sort of senior positions in government, perhaps departmental secretaries and the right and the like. Is that right? That's right. right. So at the present time, according to this document, or oh, sorry, I withdraw that, at the time this document was um, released, the SES3 had four SES3. And to achieve 7% requires 
one additional appointment to SES3, assuming that the four who are already there would remain. Is that right? Um, Sorry, you need five. Sorry, I'll withdraw that. So four remaining and then five additional. That is my understanding of this document. In your experience in terms of APS employment and the movement of people and the levels of recruitment, is achieving five additional positions over five years at SES3 level something that would be difficult to attain? I, I do not think so. It's a relatively small number over a long period. If... Uh, the disclosure rate is higher than the 7% as you've suggested, then do you think this strategy needs to address the real numbers in terms of people who need to be employed rather than the non-disclosed numbers? I think I think the it absolutely does. I think there needs to be a better and clearer understanding of the starting point um, to actually set the goals that would be appropriate. Is one of the assumptions that has to underpin this strategy is that when people uh, become employees of the APS that they have to disclose their disability and that would be essential to this policy or strategy working effectively? Um, That that is not something the union has taken a position on. Um, uh, I think that whilst there are uh, concerns for employees in, a, in disclosing their status, um, I think the starting point has to be um, providing a supportive culture and environment for people to feel comfortable um, uh, to, to make those disclosures. I don't, we haven't taken a view and I'd be reluctant to do that without um, consulting with our employee, our members in this space. On, no, on- I don't want to put you in any difficult position. But I think what I'm trying to, to understand, and I'll ask the representatives from the Australian government later this week, is if you devise a strategy with an assumption about the existing numbers and an assumption about how you're going to achieve a particular target and what underpins those assumptions might not be accurate or complete, that does have implications, does it not, for the strategy to be effective? Absolutely. Mr Connolly, I'm not going to ask you to comment directly on this strategy, but does the ACTU have a view about setting quotas or targets of this kind? And if so, are you able to assist the Royal Commission about whether strategies of this kind to set targets or quotas are effective? Look, um, Councillor, it's it's an area that um, I I wouldn't, again, a bit like Melissa comment on without, it's not part of our current policy area. Um, Yeah, I need to add that, yeah, clearly, um, yeah, having a target um, has has some merit and I think there's other areas of law in relation to gender equality where we've been able to be effective um, by doing, doing such. No, I think that's thinking for us to do. Um, you've also, think- but you've commented in your uh, statement on this issue around disclosure and also the issue around intersectionality, that people are not just people with disability, they'll also be women, people from diverse backgrounds, et cetera. So uh, rather than perhaps ask you about quotas and targets, what's your experience then on disclosure because this question of either requiring disclosure or allowing the person with disability to decide for themselves whether they want to share their disability identity, how does that have an impact then on developing policy if you're looking at, for example, increasing labour force participation of people with disability? Yeah, I I think, again, it's an area that we haven't formed a view on in relation to the requirement for disclosure because of the areas we identify in our statement about the complexities, the respect for the individual views and their own situations. And I think the point Melissa's made well is the the issue that we face today is the lack of confidence that people have in relation to disclosure and their experience of work. And I think until we can overcome some of those uh, bigger systemic issues, um, this conversation about disclosures, unfortunately, um, it will remain complex. 
Can I turn to the final topic I want to ask you about, Ms Donnelly, which is the work that CPSU has been doing on the specific issue of mental health in the workplace. And uh, for workers with psychosocial disability and workers with mental health issues, you think there needs to be an approach where workplaces understand mental health issues from a work health and safety issue? And you say, I think, in your statement that in supporting workers with mental health issues, there is a role for employers to look at what might be risk factors in the workplace that could either cause or exacerbate mental health. So I hope I've done justice to summarising that part of your statement. But could you tell the Royal Commission what strategies and approach has the CPSU taken to address mental health issues in the workplace? I'm sure. Uh, mental health in issues in the workplace have become a, an increasing um, area that is raised with us by um, our members and delegates and an increasing area of concern. Um, uh, two or three years ago, we commenced um, a, a piece of work that we have um, engaged in uh, with a range of uh, major APS agencies. Uh, that really was based on getting a better understanding of people's mental health concerns and how they were being addressed in the workplace and then seeking to engage with those agencies to address um, the policies in place to support people um, as well as um, running training for our members and delegates around mental health first aid. The real, I guess, genesis for, for this was uh, we became acutely aware that um, mental health issues um, in the workplace, when they manifest um, at, a, you know, a, a late stage in the process and come to the union's attention, is very difficult to support uh, people. And there are a range of concerns um, that are essentially industrial or collective in nature that drive um, some of the, or exacerbate rather, um, some of the, the um, uh, contributing factors. Um, so we took the view that um, it would be, you know, in our members' interest, it would be in the employer's interest, and it would provide a better and safer workplace if we can have better um, support systems and better understanding of the triggers and how to assist people early in, in that process. So that, that is an ongoing piece of work that we're continuing to do. Um, and I think that it is really important in terms of um, addressing um, broader workplace health and safety issues and for people um, for people with a disability, um, some of these uh, mental health uh, factors as well um, can have that, that, I guess, that intersectionality can have a, a, an additional impact on, um, on their um, safety and, and uh, wellbeing at work. It's a case, isn't it, sometimes if mental health issues arise in workplaces, it can raise some really challenging issues on all sides for the worker, but also for the employer, and in some cases, the impact on other employees. Absolutely. How do you navigate, how does an employer, in your experience, uh, navigate these issues in a way that seeks to understand disability, but also seeks to ensure that the employer can comply with a range of other legal obligations in relation to other employees. And I know this is a sensitive and difficult issue, but it's an issue I think the Royal Commission would be assisted in understanding that if there's a perception of a clash of interests or rights, what do employers need to be doing to better address those circumstances? Um, I think one of the um, factors that exacerbates these situations is uh, when the managers or management um, don't have the capability um, to, to deal with them um, as early as possible. I've never seen a situation in a workplace um, that involves uh, mental health issues, uh, particularly for uh, people who may also identify with a disability that um, improves without, um, without thoughtful um, intervention to try to address the concerns. Um, so we would, uh, circumstances where uh, mental health is a key factor, 
um, in terms of individual grievances. If it is, if it comes to the, the union's attention for a representation at a late stage in that there are other proceedings, other workplace proceedings um, or uh, uh, disciplinary proceedings already um, afoot, it is very difficult um, in those circumstances to navigate a successful outcome for all parties, um, and which really, I mean, it's that realisation um, which really drove our work to try to um, get better p policies and pr procedures and education earlier in the process um, to assist people when these issues arise. I might put this to Mr Connolly. This doesn't sound any different to the approach that we expect employers to take in avoiding, say, physical injuries in workplaces. We have very robust work health and safety laws that are designed to provide safe workplaces. In your experience, can you comment at all on that intersection between work health and safety and the rights of workers with disability? Yeah, if I might, um, thank you, Councillor. I, I think um, it is an important area and I, I think um, the point you allude to, or Melissa's just commented on about um, psychosocial health and mental health, and that is an area that's emerging as sort of one that's for, you know, very much um, in our minds currently. But I think to answer your question, perhaps the frameworks you refer to um, are so critical in terms of the capacity of workers to have a right, a positive right, and equally a clear and positive obligation on employers to provide the health and safe protections for people and their health and safety at work. And that is a framework that, you know, I think it's 1983 uh, fundamentally that we adopted um, what is now the current OHS framework. So, you know, a, a while ago, but it was a significant step in making that, uh, making it clear and explicit that this is an expectation for um, the nation and then all of the states are, are adopted similar legislation about that fundamental right and the associated frameworks. And that, I think, is the missing piece here, inclusive of positive obligations. It's the missing piece that is in our minds about what's the next step for. OHNS law in this regard and mental and mental health and psychosocial health, absolutely. And how do we bridge that gap uh, as this is a workplace health and safety issue in our minds? But similarly, I think it's illustrative and perhaps instructive about what's missing in terms of the rights of uh, workers with disability and how do you shift to providing that positive obligation, hence some of the amendments that we refer to and have consistently called for in terms of amendments to the Fair Work Act about providing a positive obligation and removing some of the, um, you know, frankly antiquated protections that are in the legislation currently to create the framework that's missing um, in our minds anyway in this area so we can advance uh, the cause and rights for workers with disability to participate more properly in open employment. Commissioners, I'm mindful of the time and both uh, witnesses have prepared very comprehensive and detailed statements, but the commissioners may have some questions. Yes, thank you. I'll ask Commissioner Ryan first. Do you have any questions? Um, just a couple for Ms Donnelly. Um, Ms Donnelly, you might have heard in evidence yesterday uh, people ventilating the idea of introducing quotas for the um, or, or targets, um, well, at the moment, targets or quotas. Does your union have any reservations about the possibility of that occurring? Um, no, I think that um, it, for, for in the public service, um, it, it would be our view absolutely that the government and the public sector should lead the way in employment in a range of groups um, and the um, whether it's characterised as such in the um, APS strategy, but the target of 7% effectively um, would operate in that way. Um, we have across the APS had a range of targets um, at different times around, um, you know, employment with uh, employees with disability, employees of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background. Um, I think uh, I, my only reservation is that um, w once you set a target, it's got to be uh, driven um, with policy and resourcing and prioritisation to actually achieve that. I think at times um, at a public sector level, we've seen uh, strategy documents and targets, or um, uh, uh, but they have not been able to, you know, make a difference um, in terms of the actual employment numbers, um, both around recruitment and retention issues. The, the other thing that arises for me and my 
own previous experience in the public sector is it's very hard to change the profile of the public sector without a considerable amount of external recruitment. Um, one of the things that tends to lock people with disabilities out of the public sector is that more often than not, a lot of uh, positions in the public sector are internally recruited and it's recycling the same number of people. And it is some, that situation is somewhat exacerbated by the fact that uh, there's been um, downward pressure on some areas of the public sector where people with disabilities might enter. Are you relaxed about the possibility that it might, in order to achieve a significant increase of people with disabilities, particularly I notice the areas that apparently where there'll be a significant need for increase is at the um, um, is at APS 6 and, uh, and the first level of the SES. There's about 2,000 new people with disabilities required to meet that target. That would be a considerable amount of external recruitment over a number of years in order to change the profile of the public sector. Would, does that give the union any cause for concern? Um, so across the APS um, over the last uh, number of years, we have seen that uh, what you characterise as downward pressure on AP, uh, APS numbers. That actually doesn't necessarily reflect the total workforce of the uh, of the Australian Public Service, or I should say that doesn't <laughs> reflect the um, actual work done um, for the Australian Public Service. And I could uh, to give you an example, the NDIA, which has a higher staff profile of employees with a disability, as you'd expect. I believe that it's 11% off the top of my head. Um, that is an agency where um, the government's staffing cap has had particular implications with very high use of labour hire employees. Um, and we, uh, in that uh, agency, with higher use, uh, sorry, higher uh, rates of employment uh, relative of employees with a disability and that use of labour hire has caused particular concern. So we would absolutely welcome um, those kind of uh, roles um, you know, being brought directly into the APS because the circumstances where people face a, if you, if I could characterise it as a double disadvantage of um, uh, dealing with um, being an employee with a disability and dealing with potential barriers, but also dealing with insecure work and uncertain about who you're, who has the obligations to you to make reasonable adjustments and make your workplace safe for you has actually caused a range of very significant problems and is a disincentive uh, for employees with a disability to, to work in the public sector. So, so you'd agree with me that in order to achieve um, any sort of ambitious target of change in the profile of the public sector with regard to people with disabilities, it would need to be not just a target set, but a significant change to the way in which we recruit um, and appoint uh, public servants uh, in order to achieve that target. Yes, and that, I would agree there needs to be um, significant change in how um, processes are undertaken. There is, for example, um, recruitability used. Um, and I had a look yesterday at the APS Jobs Gazette and overwhelmingly um, the numbers of jobs advertised um, uh, are, you know, are against that program. You know, that program is included, rather, I should say. Um, but it's not resulting in um, those employment numbers. So I think that it is about the actual recruitment um, decisions and processes and um, circumstances where there are artificial barriers um, being imposed now that need to be addressed. And the use of um, those kind of insecure work arrangements, particularly in an agency like NDIA, um, represents a, a significant double disadvantage um, for employees with a disability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Galbally, do you have any questions? Um, I th the disclosure discussion um, is very striking, really, that people are scared to disclose, you know, frankly, um, that they're scared about how they'll be treated. Um, so, you know, the the strategies to change things. I'm just interested in the ACTU. I mean, that is very, very serious, isn't it? Um, that people are so frightened to disclose their disability in a workplace. Absolutely, yeah, Commissioner. I think um, it is a significant concern and it's a significant drag on our effectiveness in this space. Um, and I think, you know, the challenge is um, you know, workers, uh, within this category and ourselves as a community more broadly. I think, you know, your point about the cultural issues and the systemic issues here um, really, you know, talk to how significant this is. If we're going to make the changes we, um, you know, need to make quite clearly, um, 
then it's a it's a very you know, a big shift are required, um, not just from employers um, and you know participants in the workplace, co-workers, uh, and you know, um, others uh, ourselves included, but equally, um, you know, much wider than that in terms of governments and you know cultural participants as well and um, so social participants, um, yeah. because I think that's our our um, experience and our own as an employer. We don't require. Um, disclosure, welcome it, but don't require it. And I think um, we're a, a very progressive employer, I think is probably how I'd uh, describe us. Well, requiring it in the current environment when people are really scared to disclose um, might be very counterproductive. But Ms. Ms Donnelly, what strategies do you think your union, um, you know, you must be very concerned about this from your survey. So, you know, what, what can be done to make it much safer? It's obviously people feel very unsafe. Um, and, look, that's a very good question, Commissioner. We, um, as I outlined earlier, we obviously deal with individual matters in this space, um, but uh, dealing with an individual matter isn't going to change those attitudinal or cultural um, issues that people feel in the workplace. Um, so we have... Um, done uh, uh, a range of work, particularly in workplaces or agencies where we know there is a larger cohort um, of employees with a disability. So specifically in NDIA, we have done um, uh, agency-specific work to identify people's concerns, to, to advocate um, for them where there's, you know, concerns around reasonable adjustment not being afforded properly, concerns about how management have engaged um, you know, or supported employees with a disability. Um, so in part, our strategy where we can is to um, collectivise uh, these issues, to take um, the responsibility off individuals and, and um, be able to take it forward as a collective issue um, uh, and advocate in that way. In terms of the mental uh, health space, um, which, uh, you know, for some employees will um, relate to um, identification of a disability. The work that we, um, that I alluded to earlier about um, uh, surveying and then seeking improvements in policies and undertaking training is also really designed to um, shift understanding and engagement with that issue from um, it, both individual, um, but, you know, it's a problem to something that, you know, it's okay, um, but we need to support people and address these issues in the workplace so people are safe. So they're some of the kinds of strategies that, we're, that we are seeking to undertake. And um, the low um, uh, um, levels... Gabby, I'm a little conscious of the time. time. I've got one more question. Yes, the, right. the, the low levels of reasonable adjustment is reported in your survey too are of great concern. Um, the resistance to adjust a workplace um, for workers, including flexible arrangements, which, which comes up in the ACTU um, policy as well. I wonder if you could both comment on that. Thank you. I think that um, from our perspective, the issues around reasonable adjustment and the experiences employees with a disability have, um, either in not being able to be, not, not being accommodated or having issues um, along the way, whether it's implementation or delay or difficulty, really exacerbate the kind of cultural workplace issues um, about how people feel supported in the workplace. Uh, it's not to say that everyone has a bad experience, but um, at least in the survey results we had, a, a lot of people people face difficulty in this space and um, it's perhaps unsurprising then if you're an employee with a disability and you see someone else have uh, real trouble um, mm -hmm. being accommodated that you, you think it's not worth disclosing. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just sort of add to that, um, you know, Commissioner, um, I, I think the issue here is just, it's fundamentally discretionary and that's our experience, there's, po there's positive experiences um, yeah, of course, and progressive employers make make um, go out of their way to make the adjustments rightly because they've got a commitment and a value alignment um, on this issue. But um, any and far too many, um, I think, um, have the discretion not to do that, and that's the issue about how do you create a positive obligation here. I you know, previously worked in the transport sector. It's difficult. Yeah, of course, many issues uh, confront that industry. 
but um, I think much could, more could be done uh, pro if there was a positive obligation because the hurdles um, to, to adjustment are, are not, not always um, insurmountable or unreasonable as the current legal framework uh, provides the escape clause for. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms Donnelly, um, could you tell me what proportion, please, of the APS are members of your union? Um, it would be around uh, 30%. If there's 8.4% or 8% roughly of people identify as, pe as people with disability, uh, that would suggest there are about 2,500 people with disability then who are members. Is that right? Is that about right? Broadly so, yes. You had 52 responses to your survey, did you not? That's right. It's not, it's not enough to draw any general conclusions, is it? No, I mean, we, we do not have um, the systems in place um, for the union to... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not being critical. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that if you've got 52 responses to a survey, it's very difficult to draw statistics... Well, we can't draw statistically valid conclusions from it, so we have to be a little bit cautious about that, I imagine. Absolutely. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, Mr Connolly, uh, it's a little odd that the ACTU's policy makes no reference at all to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It rather suggests that uh, it hasn't figured uh, really in the thinking of the ACTU. One might have expected there to be at least some reference to it. Uh, I think, um, as I said, it isn't foremost in our minds. These conventions aren't in terms of our, our work domestically and these... these um, Policies speak to our domestic priorities. Um, um, odd in terms of not, all of our policies don't call out the relevant conventions as foundation stones, but um, I think we take it as read, and you can assume um, that they are the framework and foundations for all of our policy frameworks, be they referred to or otherwise. But your point's um, noted. It's hard for it to be part of the framework if it's not referred to, I would have thought. Um, I don't agree with that, um, Commissioner. You don't agree with that? No, the, 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 the international conventions about the rights of workers are fundamental to the work of the ACTU. I, I, I'm not talking about the ILO. I'm talking about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Well, well this is one of the conventions that go to workers' rights and it's included right, in so it. Your position is it plays a significant part in the thinking of the ACTU, even if it's not referred to in a policy specifically dealing with the employment of people with disabilities. In this policy area, I, I think I've said it provides a foundation to how we approach this issue. All right. Um, the policy refers to the settlement of a class action, paragraph 17, which resulted in a $100 million settlement uh, for underpaid workers with disability. Who brought that action? Well, when I say that, I assume it's a representative proceeding and there'd be, an, as it were, a nominal plaintiff or applicant. But who supported the proceedings? Uh, can I take that on notice, Commissioner, and come back to you? I haven't I'm got that to hand. I, I'm just wondering whether the 70% refers to a settlement that said that the total award was 70% of the wages taken or whether that reflects uh, something that was taken by a litigation funder. Chair, I'm sorry to jump uh -huh. in. Um, even though these matters are addressed in Mr Conley's statement, these are going to be issues that we'll explore in a future hearing where we're looking yeah, well, at if, supportive if, That's all right. If Mr Connolly is able to help us... Uh, yeah, I can, provide, I can I'll come back to you, uh, Commissioner. Happy yeah, to do you. so. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I assume that there are no represented parties uh, that uh, wish to ask questions of either Mr. Ms. Donnelly or Mr. Connolly, unless someone jumps up. If uh, that being the case, thank you very much for giving evidence today and for the statements that you have uh, provided. We appreciate the assistance that you have given to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioners, can I just note as the session concludes that in terms of the CPSU survey with respect to the responses on the questions of adjustments, page seven of the survey sets out those responses. The question of adjustments was raised in a number of different areas, not all in one area. So the survey results are quite different. So I could just ask the Commissioners in looking at the evidence in relation to the responses on adjustments that they need to be looked at in the various areas because the responses differ. For example, 
70% of respondents said that their physical needs were being met in the areas of digital accessibility and a sort of more general reasonable adjustments, there were different responses. So I just think it might be helpful for Ms Donnelly's evidence to be considered in its um, full context. And are they responses of a cohort of 52? Yes, that's right. Yep. All uh, right, thank so you very much. Uh, Shall think... we take an adjournment now to 11.25? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Commission. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Our next witness is Jennifer Westercott AO, and she's the Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Australia. Yes, we'll wait for Ms. Westcott to come onto the screen. Yes, good morning, Ms. Westcott. We can now see you. I hope you can hear us. I can. I can I can yep. hear you and I can see you. Thank you. That's excellent. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. And thank you for the statement that you have provided. I just want to explain where everybody is. Uh, Commissioner Galbally is joining the hearing from Melbourne. Uh, I'm in the Sydney hearing room uh, with uh, Commissioner Ryan, who was on my right and Ms Eastman, who will be asking you some questions, Senior Counsel assisting the Royal Commission is also in the Sydney hearing room. I'll now ask Ms Eastman to ask some questions. Thank you. Uh, so you are Jennifer Westercott? That is correct, yes. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Australia. Great. Right. And that's a role that you've held since 2011. That's correct. And prior to that, you have a long career in both the public and private sector, and you've held senior leadership positions in both the New South Wales and Victoria governments. That's correct. And you were for a time a senior partner at KPMG. Correct. And in addition to the work that you do with the Business Council of Australia, you're also a patron of Mental Health Australia. Correct. And a patron, a co-patron of Pride in Diversity. That's correct. So the BCA, if I can use the shorthand expression, has provided a submission to the Royal Commission in September this year. Have you got a copy of that yes, uh, submission with you? Yes, sir. Are there any corrections that you wish to make? Uh, no, Councillor, no. And the contents of the submission are true and correct, is that right? That's correct. I, might, I thought I might start by asking you a little bit about the role of the Business Council. As you may be aware, this hearing of the Royal Commission is looking at the employment of people with disability in what we describe as open employment. And our focus is on how employers have responded or will respond perhaps to the systemic barriers that we identified in our previous hearing and through the work of the Royal Commission. So one of the issues which has arisen is the role of the private sector and large Australian employers. And you may be aware that we've asked a number of the large corporations, many I think are members of the BCA, to tell us a little bit about their employment practices and also the number of employees with disability recorded in their human resources systems. Those numbers are quite low. When we added up together, we got to 1.15%, but in many cases, the large employers in, have in their own systems records suggesting that the number of people with disability in their organisations is less than 1%. So that's the background where we thought it would be helpful to hear from the Business Council of Australia. But if I could just invite you to tell the Royal Commissioners a little bit about the way in which the Business Council operates and the extent to which it represents the interests of large business and small to medium businesses to that extent in Australia. Uh, thank you, Council. So the Business Council um, was established in 1983. It's made up of mostly the large corporate sector, has 136 members, and that is across the entire economy. Um, 
we have essentially in council three core roles. The first is policy advocacy that goes to skill, tax, um, regulation, the, the traditional things that you would expect an industry organisation like us to advocate uh, for. The second role is what we call member services, where we bring members together uh, to give briefings on key issues, to give them access to leaders in our community, political leaders, and to run uh, sessions of interest to them. So, you know, particularly during uh, the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns, we of course have been very active assisting members uh, with many of the, the public health orders. And the third role, which I think is probably less well understood is what we call our community role. And we have two principal kind of areas there. The first is we run a program called Strong Australia, where we try and get CEOs from across the economy into regional communities and into uh, diverse communities to listen to people about what are their issues and, and the sorts of things that they would uh, appreciate Corporate Australia doing. And the second part of that is a charitable organisation we run called Biz Rebuild, which uh, we set up after the bushfires, the only charity in Australia that is allowed to assist um, uh, business, private sector uh, recipients. So that's um, effectively our role. So it's a policy advocacy group, a member organisation, and uh, we're trying to, what I call, coordinate the impact uh, in the community. So uh, I want to bring your attention to the issue of the employment of people with disability. Sure. And the Royal Commissioners have, and Commissioners, this is tab 4B in bundle A, a copy of the Business Council of Australia's report recognising ability, business and the employment of people with disability that the BCA released in October 2015. And I referred to that in making some opening remarks yesterday. So reflecting on the six years or so that have passed since this report was released, I thought it might be helpful just to start with going back and looking at how the BCA has approached the issue of workers with disability and the findings of this report. So the commissioners have got the hard copy of it and I don't need to go through it in detail. But can I uh, understand this, that the report was really a summary of the results of a survey conducted by the BCA of its members and the purpose was to generate baseline data right. and insights about disability employment practices and the experience among member companies. Was there anything to the best of your recollection that prompted the need for the survey at this time? Was there something that caused that concern or had there just been an issue that the BCA felt that it needed to address when it came to the employment of people with disability? I can't remember a particular trigger council, but I think it was more the latter that we we certainly had had a long history of doing an indigenous survey and trying to get baseline data, but also trying to establish what best practice looked like. Uh, and um, we did this survey to to do those two things, to get that baseline data as well as to start to identify the sorts of best practice. And then in two thousand and sixteen, we put out, um, a guide for, you know, the sorts of things that people should be thinking about. Um, and it's always important to try and see, you know, which are the companies that are leading, um, you know, what is working. And, and also from an advocacy point of view, we try and use this to say, well, what are the sorts of things that we should be then advocating for in terms of better coordination of government services and so on. So that, that's my recollection of the, of the trigger for doing it. But it's not uncommon for us to do surveys uh, across uh, our membership to kind of get that baseline. We've done something similar on gender a few years ago where we looked at uh, why women were not progressing through the leadership pipeline and we did some very extensive work with McKinsey on that. So it's not, it's a, it's a very usual thing for us to do. Ms Westbrook, I wonder if I could just encourage you to speak a little more slowly. Oh, of course, to, I'm sorry. We do have to have a uh, real-time transcript and it's tra translated into Auslan. That is, I have to reassure you, it's not the first time we've had to ask a witness to do that, but we would be grateful. Thank you. No, I, of course. So for this survey, 37 responses uh, were received. And in terms of the 37 responses and looking at the uh, composition of the BCA. That's a third of the members 
and the collective workforce of the respondents was 664,000. Oh, sorry, 600, 600, sorry, I've got my numbers wrong, 664,000. That's page seven of the report. That's correct, yep. So um, in terms of the response, the survey findings appear at page six. Yep. And the findings set out a number of key findings, but also what there's a paragraph, what works, and also the identification of barriers, and then over the page, drivers and benefits. So just looking at the key findings, so 75% of the companies who responded have a plan or a strategy regarding employing people with disability, and mostly 60% included that in its overall diversity strategy. And just looking, jumping down, uh, companies with large workforces, over 20,000 people, are more likely to actively seek applicants with disability and have a dedicated role in human resources. And jumping down another one, 93% of companies surveyed had a strategy to recognise and support mental health issues in the workplace. So they were some of the key findings. That's correct. And then in terms of what works, these are going to be some issues that we're going to speak about shortly, but these are a range of initiatives to, to do what? To identify increasing labour force participation That's or correct. for uh, supporting employees while they are in, in employment? I, I think it's both, Council, because I think um, one of the things we've always been very conscious of is making sure that it's not just about getting people into jobs, it's about making sure that people are successful in employment. So these were the sorts of um, uh, bits of analysis that showed people, you know, what was working in both um, initial recruitment, retention and advancement. And part of the purpose of this survey was to get a sense of the, the data, so what right. the numbers might be. And against that background, um, did you do you think you've got a sort of clear sense of the labour force participation, at least in the large corporates in Australia, for people with disability? I don't think we got the um, granular data that I think tells you uh, how many people are being employed what sectors are they being employed in, where have you got gaps? And obviously this is something that the Commission is going to look into, uh, which is this kind of whole question of data collection. Um, I mean, we, we suspect um, that there's quite a lot of under-reporting because people, uh, you know, one of the things employers tell me is they're quite anxious about asking people to disclose. Uh, so that's something we might explore this morning. But... Um, it's very much about making sure that we get a handle on, on what companies are doing versus necessarily getting um, a lot of data about who they're employing. But in our survey that we'll be doing next year, we're going to try and get much more granular information about what are people actually doing in terms of the number of people they employ. All right. I want to ask you, because one of the factors the Royal Commission has to look at is the results that we saw yesterday of companies having less than 1% is how do they identify disability and how do they collect that relevant data? Yes. And just going back to what you learnt in October 2015, if you've got the document on page 14. Yes. There's a heading at the bottom page which is identifying disability status. And 54%, so about half of the companies had some method of recording the disability status of applicants or employees. And then of that half, 78% asked as part of an employee survey and 64% asked at a recruitment stage. So that, that's significant, is it not? That if half the companies have no method of recording disability status at all, 
then does it, do we take it that it's just a little bit of guesswork or perhaps relying on anecdotal information as to what the numbers might be in your workplace? Yeah, I, with disability? I think there are a couple of things to, to say about that, Council. I think, first of all, there are some definitional issues that I think uh, the Commission might want to, to look into. So the, the definition uh, is different between the ABS, um, it's different between the Discrimination Acts, it's different between the employment services. So I think getting a common definition would be helpful. Um, I think certainly when I've asked employers about this, there is a bit of anxiety about asking people about whether or not that in and of itself is a breach of a discrimination provision. And so I think, again, that would be helpful. Um, and then I think it is about kind of setting up those systems uh, for tracking uh, and making sure that we're recording at the recruitment stage. And I think we've got to separate potentially asking the information at recruitment, which would also include adjustments that people need versus then surveying uh, the workforce. And of course, the whole issue about people's willingness to disclose. So I think it's a complex area, Council, in terms of getting the accurate data that um, obviously we all need going forward to, so, to get a better baseline, but also to identify gaps and issues about where we should put more attention. Mm. Over the page, there's a few more results. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, this says of those participating in the survey, 65% of companies do not ask yes. as part of their recruitment process whether an applicant has disability. And is it your view that one of the reasons for that might be concern about whether you can ask that question? That's correct. Certainly anecdotally that's what companies are concerned about because uh, they don't want to be in breach of any provision um, but, of course, they do ask people if they need adjustment. Um, so I think it's a complex area about what is the right way to get that information at both the recruitment stage and then, of course, to track uh, your employment, your employee population to make sure that we're getting that data um, as accurate as possible. And then in terms of sort of overall numbers, uh, the paragraph that starts recent analysis of the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, suggests that the rates of employment might be as high as 9.2% in the private sector and 9.4% in the government sector. Now, those are numbers that we're not seeing translating yes. into the responses that we've received from employers. So it raises this issue, doesn't it, is that if we're going to, to think about strategies for improving labour force participation and also opportunities for workers with disability during the course of their careers, do we not need to start with having some clarity about what the actual numbers might be or close to it to start thinking about what strategies might work or not work and then what follows, how we evaluate any strategies? Oh, I couldn't agree more. I think this is a kind of really urgent task that we start to get the data and, and I would suggest that this should be co-designed with industry as much as possible, Council, because quite often people ask for things and I look at it and I think there would be a much better way of collecting that information. You'd get much more accuracy. So I think that's I think my suggestion would be we need to first of all sort out definitional issues because I think we need to be making sure that we're talking about uh, there's some, you know, there is a common set of definitions. But to your point, I think we do need a national effort on data collection and reporting. And uh, my only suggestion is that that be co-designed with industry so that we're getting information that does um, two things. Uh, it gives us that baseline, well, three things actually. It gives us the baseline, it identifies gaps, and from my perspective, we need total system change and total culture change, and we need the data to tell us about that system and culture change. So what are the barriers? What, what can employers do? What kind of systems do they need supporting them in, in the government sector? So I think it's got, it's got to have that level of precision. Oh, and the other thing is whether or not we're tracking people's advancement. So one of the things that we do in other areas is 
we're starting to look more closely at it's not just are people in a job, are they in a job, are they advancing? Because we want to make sure people are getting to their full potential. So I think it's got to have that level of sophistication, Council, so that we really drive major systemic and cultural change. The uh, report that BCA did was followed by a report from the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2016, the Willing to Work report. And we've also got a document that you provided to the Royal Commission prepared by the Australian Network on Disability on sharing and monitoring disability information in your workforce. So that's uh, Commissioner's yep. Tab 4A. And... Uh, just in summary, that uh, guideline from AND addresses those issues about what questions you can ask and what information can you seek from people with, who might be applying for jobs with respect to disability. That's correct. So can I put it this way? There's sort of nothing new on this, but it seems not much has changed and do you have any reflections on why there has been little or no change over the past six years or so, just looking at your own uh, membership? Yeah, I, I think we'll, you'll find that there has been change at a company level, and I know you're talking to many companies today, and I think that what, what we haven't seen is total systems change, as I talk about it, and I think that's the challenge, is how do we make sure that... Um, that the entire uh, business community, be they the large corporates or the SME sector, that the government sector are working in tandem to lift those numbers, that we're tracking that. I think, you know, if I think about other areas, and I know there are these comparisons are always got um, limitations with them, but if I think about gender reporting, just by way of example, I know there are massive differences. I do think that the use of a kind of common reporting framework across uh, the private sector in particular has given everyone a sense of baseline and data. And if I think about other things like modern slavery reporting, it does then mean that boards, um, you know, start to look at those areas and obviously uh, push harder in terms of performance and targets. So I think I think your point is correct. I think the first starting point is how do we lift the data? I mean, there are other things, obviously, we have to do simultaneously. We can't do this sequentially. But I, I think you'll find that at, at a company level, people have been focused on a lot of action. And, and what I think is missing is a system approach. If I think about gender, where we've had much more of a national system approach to uh, correcting some of the obviously very significant issues there. When you're talking about a system approach, just walk me through that. Uh, what all, are that? What are the elements of systems? Are we talking law, practice, policy, yeah. attitudes? Or are we talking about something uh, a little more prescriptive in terms of regulating the way in which the corporations, for example, might collect information, report to information? I think, first of all, as I said, definitional. The second would be reporting. And I would encourage reporting not just across the private sector, but reporting across the public and private sector, and that needs to be comparable. So I think in the first um, iteration of the gender reporting, if my memory serves me correctly, government was exempted originally from that reporting. And so that made it very difficult to make um, comparisons. And that, of course, government is, of course, 30% of the economy. So I think we need to make sure that we've got a, a reporting standard. As I said, I think a really good system would have that done co-design with uh, industry themselves. I think what I also mean, Council by system, is that there is a predictable, easy to access set of support arrangements that allow employers or make it easier for employers uh, to retain people, to recruit people and to advance people. Um, and that goes to a lot of the work, as you know, that government's doing at the moment around the disability employment services. So um, things like um, how do we make sure that we have a better interface between those providers and um, companies, be they large or small, 
How do we move to a better system of recruitment? Uh, how do we make sure that online recruitment is sensitive to this, given that that, that is now the pervasive way of doing recruitment? Um, how do we make sure that, um, that we are um, assisting people to stay in work and um, that, that, that those supports are in place? How do we get a um, cultural lift across the, across the community? Um, how do we get some of that training and awareness done around, uh, particularly at the middle management level? And one of the things that, that we have looked at, um, it's not easy to do this, but I, I think that we need to think about more of a demand-led employment model. What I mean by that is that at the moment, you've got a system where it's opportunistic, if you will. So a vacancy occurs a disability employment services tries to match someone to a vacancy or they try and put them into training, um, which may or may not be fit for purpose for the kind of work that they could do. If we could move to a more systematised way that particularly the big recruiters, so the companies that take, you know, quite a large number of people, could identify that in advance, then we could get a much better arrangement with the disability employment services then targeting the training and so on uh, so that we can have like a, if you will, like an intake system, a much better use of graduate programs and internships. And then the final point I'd make council in, on a system level is that, uh, and as you know, the business council has a very strong view about this. We need to find better ways of upskilling and training people. So, you know, I'm a very strong advocate of micro credentials that candidates can stack so that people can see that they've got certain capabilities. Uh, at the moment, that's, that's a very clunky system and people can't be expected to go and do a two-year diploma or a three-year degree. So a system that allows an employer to say, I need this person to have these kind of capabilities, I need to be able to see the candidate's capabilities, and then you're placing people, if that makes sense. So I know that's a long answer to your question, but that's what I mean by a systems approach. So if we're going to take our systems approach, I mean, how do we also look forward that in the sense that the way in which we work has changed? COVID-19 has had a very significant impact on the way in which we work, but also the design of jobs and where jobs are needed. So I think pre-COVID, there was a lot of discussion about the gig economy. Yes. That's gone a little bit quiet. It may, may revive. So the way in which we work and the way in which employers need labour is also changing. If we have a system that's built on historically how we've brought people with disability into the workplace without thinking about what the work might be in the future, how do we ensure that we don't develop a system that really is just replicating the old and is not responsive to the new uh, it's a very good point. So the first point I'd make to that is that um, the, the most important resource that companies have always needed and, and all businesses, but this is going to be increasingly the case, is talent. And if you're excluding a whole uh, swathe of people from participation, then you are not getting the talent, the potential, the productivity, the performance. So I think we've got to take an economic lens to this as a country. I know there are moral and social issues and I'm not trying to diminish those in any way, but I think putting an economic lens to this, and you made this point yourself, I think yesterday, Council, in your opening remarks around the, the, the estimate that around $43 billion would be added to the economy if you could um, cut by a third the unemployment rate amongst people with disabilities. I mean, that's a pretty substantial contribution. So I think the first thing is to get that, that lens of this is about, about people participating in the economy at the best they can be with the most support that, that, then, that is needed so that we can have a more productive um, economy and, of course, as part of that, a better society. So that's the first thing. The second thing is job design, to your point. And I think what we saw during COVID was a revolution in job design. I mean, people designed people's jobs in 24 hours. Uh, people uh, digitised organisations in a couple of months. So I do think, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I do think we've got to say, how do we take work to people rather than people to work? 
and how do we make sure that that we are designing jobs and this is not just for people with disabilities I might add this is for many people who want to spend more time with their children people who want more flexible work we know in the work we did with McKinsey a few years ago that the biggest barrier to women's uh, progression in the workplace was uh, the absence of structured flexible arrangements so how do we start thinking about you know, a job design that allows, that that is tailored around the needs of obviously the output or the product that an organisation wants, but the capability and situation uh, of the person doing the job. And I think COVID has given us an incredible window to turn this around now. Just exploring a little bit more on this concept of job design, because we're going to focus on the extent to which employers both in the public and private sector make adjustments for workers yes. with disability, whether it's got the adjective reasonable or not or however we legally characterise that. But if we start with job design and you have a system of building into the design of the job adjustments and flexibility, would that approach break down this seemingly binary idea that there's the job and then there's the adjustment. Absolutely. But the adjustment's always sort of seen as an add-on or something yes. different, perhaps from the core terms and conditions of yes. employment, or it might be the location of work, or it might be other sort of physical barriers. If you start with job design, do you start to then minimise this sort of weighty factor about adjustments and then work out whether they're reasonable or not, if that's the test, or whether it's unjustifiable hardship or not, and that's a test. So I'm keen to just get a sense from you about how you approach job design Mm -hmm. that inherently includes people with disability rather than adds disability on as the afterthought. Absolutely spot on. So I think... I think the first thing about job design is what do you want the job to do? Like what, what is the outcome or output you want the job to, to have? And, and obviously people, you know, must start with what is the task? What are the sets of tasks? Um, how does this job interact with other um, people in the workplace? And it's also, I think, really important that it's got to be co-designed with the employee because one thing that I think we need to guard against post-COVID is that we end up with whole cohorts of people who work from home and whole cohorts of people who work in an office versus what is the right mix of working in an office or working in a workplace and working at home? Because what you don't want is another set of biases creeping in where the people who work from home are the people who don't get the opportunities to collaborate they don't get the opportunities to be as visible to their employer and therefore they don't get the opportunities to progress. And that again, that's not just for people with disability. So I think co-design, because many people want to be connected with their colleagues, they want to be part of teams. So I think it's that sense, Council, of a hybrid model where people may be in the workplace X number of days, they may be in the workplace um, and, and at home other days. But but the focus has always got to be on, on what is the what is the output, and I don't I don't want to sound too too much like uh, an economist there. But it's it's what do you want people to do, and what performance do you want versus, um, you know, how many hours should people spend at work? And I I think COVID has given us all a masterclass on that because I I think most of us have not asked people what did you do at nine, what did you do at nine ten, what did you do at nine fifteen. They say, have you done that stuff I asked you to do a few weeks ago yet? You know what I mean? Like I think that's it's got to be about what's the outcome and and the and the performance that we want in a job versus, you know, a very traditional approach to how we think about how work and tasks are done. And then finally, I think a job design's got to include the skill system as we talk about in our submission. Um, we've got to make sure that that. Um, there are quick and accessible ways for people to upskill, particularly in digital. And, you know, if we want to be in the top five digital economies in the world, people using Microsoft Teams, Teams and Zoom is not a digital economy. I mean, it's one tool, but there are many other really important tools that are needed for us to be uh, digitally seriously connected. But I do think if we could focus on job design, we would break down many of the barriers that exist 
for people with a disability, as well as many other people who are often excluded from participation and, as I said, from advancement. One of the uh, points that you make in the submission provided to the Royal Commission, the Commissioners, this is behind tab four in bundle A, is you describe as the economic imperative. And do we understand by that that if we look at what might be the projections of uh, labour for Australia into the future to maintain levels of productivity but also to provide services across the community is that we need to get labour force participation at higher levels and that's across the board. It's not only for people with disability but also for women and from other areas. Is that right? Absolutely. Like if you look at just the current data, uh, we need about 500,000 people back in the labour market. Uh, that's just that's obviously a COVID phenomenon. But, you know, we, we have always uh, had an issue about the underrepresentation, the underparticipation of key parts of the community. And that just goes straight to the bottom line of the country. I mean, that is just a straight economic um, gain for Australia, as well as obviously a personal gain for people participating. And it is about removing all those barriers for people to participate at the level they want to, uh, to the potential they want to, at the time they want to. I mean, obviously, we're, gu we're guided by industrial instruments and, of course, the way uh, um, certain industries have to perform. But I don't believe it's um, beyond us to try and really think about this question that you've raised around job design, but to constantly frame this as an economic productivity agenda rather than, you know, something on the side, if that makes sense. We don't, this is central to high performing organisations. But I, I referred yesterday to a report done in, uh, well, over a decade ago by uh, Aki about saying we need to increase labour force participation of people with disability because we're otherwise going to have labour shortages. If we've known for over a decade that these are the gaps, then what, in your experience or view, has been the impediment to actually confronting that and to uh, shifting what seems to be a very sort of stubborn number in terms of workforce participation for people with disability? Yeah, as I said earlier, Council, I think, you know, again, we need to get better data. I just don't think we know really. I'm not suggesting we should not for a minute do a lot more here. So let me be very clear on the record that we should do a lot more here as a society, as a community. But I think we obviously need to get a handle on that data. Uh, the second, I think, is, you know, that system I talked about and, and working through that, and, and, and I think a real starting point would be this review of the discipline and the employment um, services that is being done by the government. I think this has just got to get, and it's always disappointing that we need royal commissions to elevate these issues, uh, and, and they often report quite bad system failure, whether it's mental health, whether it's aged care. It's always quite depressing when you, when you sort of think, why can't we kind of change these systems? But I think we need a, um, a culture change across the community to elevate this um, to a much higher status, a much higher focus. And I believe that the starting point for that is the point about this is an economic story. This is a story about Australia's economic performance. This is vital to the performance of companies. It's vital to the performance of public sector agencies, non-government agencies, and get some collective effort to lift our performance, but get that system approach. Because I think what we often do is we pick off a couple of things to fix, we fix those, but then the system itself doesn't ever seem to get much better. Are there any models that you're aware of or any experiences from other jurisdictions, OECD or otherwise, that are doing better than Australia that might assist the Royal Commission to consider? And I'm sorry, I'm springing that question on you. I hadn't asked you about that earlier. Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, we... we um, we, we certainly look at other jurisdictions and I'm happy to come back to the, to the commission on that. Um, but I think that, you know, there's, there's um, you know, a lot of companies are members of um, organisations, 
So I think and many of those are looking at the performance across jurisdictions and what works in other countries. But I might have to come back to you on that because I don't think we've really looked across, uh, you know, these jurisdictions to say what's what's working. And the commissioners have heard in a, a recent hearing about some initiatives for business on human rights protection. So the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So we had a, a bit of a discussion about that in a recent hearing. And uh, one of the questions raised in a discussion about the guiding principles was a shift in the way in which companies think about risk and looking at risk in supply chains or in the mode and method of uh, delivering services and their own employees. And so if a company shifts the thinking from the risk that the employees pose to the company's operation, to the risk that the company may pose on the human rights of people in supply chains or in their workplaces, you might start to see a sort of shift in thinking mm. on the types of issues that we've discussed, systems, job design, job processes, et cetera. So has the, uh, that idea of business adopting a human rights approach or applying those guiding principles something that's made its way into the policy work of the BCA? And if yes, do you see that that would have any relevance in starting to think about a different approach in terms of increasing labour force participation for people with disability? And I preface that by saying I'm not suggesting for one moment that you tick the box on the guiding principles on business and human rights and then terrific, you're there. I mean, there's a lot of work in that, sure. that model. I think yes is the answer. Um, for example, we were very strong advocates um, as the Business Council about modern slavery, about having a piece of legislation uh, on modern slavery, slavery having um, a reporting arrangement, trying to design that in a way that encouraged companies to go looking into their supply chains. So I think it's an example where something that... Um, uh, you know, came out of um, a UN process and obviously um, the UN human rights statements. I, I think there are many companies, certainly the companies I represent, who have a very strong focus now on human rights as a broad issue, on their supply chains, on making sure that they're leveraging their supply chains, looking at their data. So I think that's one lens that you could take and and um, but again, I would marry that with the economic and participation lens because this is good business. This is good for making sure that we are model, a model country in terms of inclusion, but it's also about really, you know, this is about getting the best people doing the best work and being their best selves at work, and that is a good story for the performance of organisations. But the UN um, uh, approach, particularly if I think about modern slavery council, which we were very strong advocates that, you know, we needed a uniform piece of legislation and uniform reporting. And I think certainly um, companies now are deeply looking at their supply chains on that. Last topic I want to ask you about before the commissioners may have some questions is sort of coming back to where we started. And that fear of employers asking questions that might identify people with disability in their workplaces and their own employees. We've heard over the course of the last day or so that there's equally a great fear for people with disability to disclose they have disability. So if that fear exists on both sides... I think one of the issues you've identified in your submission is the importance of good practice and cultural change. And a number of the observations made over the last day or so is the importance of creating safe workplaces for disclosure, if that's the right word, but just really creating an inclusive workplace as the key to it. Do you have any views on what works to build inclusive workplaces and inclusive work cultures? And perhaps the corollary to that is what doesn't work? Mm. Um, if I could think of a single thing that would, I think, drive culture, apart from an overarching thing around the economy, 
I, I think it's about signalling that people with a disability are welcome so that it's, it's, it's not a question of, um, and, and this goes to my earlier point about demand-led um, solutions and tailoring the advertising and application process. So, for example, um, Telstra offers services um, to, to help people with a disability lodge their application online. So there's some good examples, and I'm sure you'll hear some of those today as you speak to the companies. But I do think that it's important that we try and create, and I'm going to use the word normal as a normalisation point. So this is not just for people with disabilities. As you know, I'm um, patron, a co-patron of Pride and Diversity. This has been a huge issue about people um, disclosing their sexual orientation. But some great work has been done in creating networks and support networks in companies. Um, We've got, uh, through Pride and Diversity, a very structured award process and, you know, like Employers at Gold or Silver, and, uh, and as someone who hands out those awards with Alan Joyce once a year, people are very proud of getting those awards. So something like that, that fundamentally drives culture change. Um, and um, making sure that then that's followed through all the way into the company. So that obviously you need leadership, you need to signal that um, you want to employ people with a disability, you need a different system, as I said, for how you recruit. Um, but then you need to make sure that you are supporting people because what you can't have is people getting placements and, and then that falls apart in, you know, whatever, six months or something because none of the work has been done on supporting that team, on having a network to go to, on having, like, like say, in the LGBTQI system, if I may use that expression, there's a very common practice amongst the employers of having allies and, and people who people can just go and talk to who aren't necessarily their supervisors. So there are many things we can do and, and we should do. What doesn't work, I think, is complexity. <clears throat> and, you know, this is, I mean, none of, these, none of these systems are simple and no one's being naive about that. But I think complexity in application processes, particularly in the digital space, complexity of uh, job design, complexity in the service system that sits around an employer. If, if I'm particularly in the SME sector, if I, if I don't know who to go and get if, assistance, then I'm going to, by definition, steer away from employing people with a disability. So I think the system not being there to support people is very problematic. And I think, you know, certainly a lot of employers say that to me, well, I don't know where to start. These are not the big companies, but these are the mid-sized companies. I don't know where to start. So I, I think that's an issue. Um, and this is where going back to our earlier conversation about reporting would help. But I do think complexity is the enemy of open recruitment. I think the more complex these systems are, um, the, the more difficult it is for people to navigate them. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. Uh, thank you very much. Commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Galbo, did you have a question? Um, thank you. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, with the co-design issue, which um, you emphasised, and thinking about the LGBTQI um, success and, and shifting of that employment, would you also see people with disabilities in the co-design as well as the companies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and the and their carers, I think, Commissioner. Like I think what we haven't talked about carers this morning, but I think certainly when I chaired Mental Health Australia, this was a very important issue about the co-design of both um, consumers and carers. And I think it's important whether it's at the system level or whether it's at the job design level itself that we have to have consumers and carers because I think the other barrier for many people is that they are caring for someone with a disability or they're caring for someone with a mental living with a mental illness and we need to make sure that we involve carers as well but I, I think you're absolutely right commissioner that that co-design has to be with consumers and carers uh, and and my only point about designing some of these things with employers I think Sometimes when I see things coming out of government with no disrespect to government, 
you think if someone had just sat down and said, what's the problem we're trying to fix here, people would have said, well, a better way of getting that information would be A, B, C, D, or E. So, but I think it's got to be um, a very inclusive process. And that certainly has worked. Um, it's been very important um, in Pride and Diversity that that co-design process was in place. And look, my second question is regarding incentives, but also penalties. Mm. And to, you know, maybe that's too big a question to ask here, but I'd be really interested in the Business Council's views in detail about incentives and penalties that could be helpful yep. in this area. Um, it's an excellent question, Commissioner. I think on the incentives, and, and look, let's just take wage subsidies. I, I, I'm pretty confident that most companies, most of the very large companies, don't, um, don't see the kind of opportunities getting the wage subsidy. And I don't, I think that's the wrong way to think about it as well. I think what you're doing with a, um, an incentive is you're levelling the playing field for the person, for the candidate. And I think that's the way to see the wage subsidy. If you, if, if we just stay at wage subsidies for a minute, that you're actually you're giving that candidate an advantage as opposed to giving the, the company one, and you're giving them you're basically making them competitive if that makes sense. And it's really about seeing it from that prism that you're making the candidate competitive. On the penalty side, um, this is a very vexed issue. I, I think. One of the things that we have to guard against is that you want to get culture change here. And what we don't want is a system where people are ticking boxes and that they're, they're, they're doing that as a kind of means of meeting a standard or something. You really want to get companies searching into their supply chain, searching into their recruitment processes. Um, and so I think the balance of sort of carrot and stick has to be very carefully thought through. I think if we start with reporting um, and co-design that in the way we've talked about this morning, I think we'll start to get a sense of what are the areas where we need to step up in terms of targets or in terms of, uh, you know, more of, more of the stick approach. But I, I do think what we want here is fundamental system and culture change and, and getting that balance of carrot and sticks is pretty important. Thank you. Commissioner Ron. Um, Ms. Westercott, um, yesterday we had a, an excellent businessman um, who also had a disability come and tell us that you can't do what you can't see. And there was a need to sort of demonstrate what basically the point he was making is until people do this, no one will see what it looks like. And what he was basically saying is businesses need to take the initiative of uh, promoting and employing people with disability on their own, in their advertising, in their appointments to boards, in their appointments to senior office, they need to do that for people to feel welcome. I mean, your paper doesn't exactly address what I sort of think is what can business do mm -hmm. without necessarily being prompted by government? Isn't that one of the things business could do without necessarily government interfering or supporting? I, I agree with that, Commissioner. And, and, and I think that was my point earlier. If there's one thing that, that we can do, and certainly in the Business Council's role as coordination um, you know, we will certainly step up on is, is getting that sense that, you know, you are actively promoting that you, you, are, you want to hire people with a disability and you're making that known to people and you're actively setting those targets. But you'll hear from companies today and, and, and you'll see what uh, many individual companies are doing. But I think across the system, you're absolutely right. We all need to, to really lift um, that sense, that lift our ambition uh, and make sure that, that we are actively uh, targeting. But that goes to my point about demand-led employment. I think that is an easier way of doing that than sort of the opportunistic recruitment, you know, like absolutely actively working with those disability employment services to sort of target and, 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 and show that welcoming arrangement. And then uh, to my earlier point about designing the recruitment process accordingly. So I, I agree with you, in short. Um, I'm not sure that you've answered the bit of my question about is why doesn't business do, if this is good business and it's going to give you access to good talent, where is the, why, why does business need government to redesign jobs? Can't business redesign jobs? 
in order to make sure that people with disability are welcomed in? But that, that was my point, Commissioner, that businesses re- need to redesign jobs. My, my, this, this, so much of this can be done by business, and you'll hear from that today, that the issues for government are around the employment services, I think, that they, yeah. that they need to work better with government. But that's my whole point, that we, as the business community, need to think about job design. We need to send that very strong message that we want to recruit uh, people with a disability and work actively with those providers. The job of government is making sure that the support system is in place to make that easier. Um, in your yeah, just one more here. Um, in your uh, presentation to the commission, um, there's a remark here that says for many companies, a focus on disability is competing with other diversity focus areas, gender balance, indigenous engagement for resources. Um, what did you mean by that? It almost suggests that this is a grudge purchase. Um, is that what was intended? I'm sure no, not, not at all. Not at all. I think that, that you know, companies are actively looking at their inclusion policies and they are actively looking at all of those uh, areas, um, but not at all is, is, that, is, is that the case. I think it's just that, that you know, many companies are doing many things uh, simultaneously and it's about making sure that they've got the right systems in place for um, categories of employees uh, and that they are organising themselves in a kind of comprehensive inclusive policy. That, that's all I'm saying, that, that, we, that, that inclusion has to be across the board, but you are going to have to take particular bespoke actions for, say, Indigenous, for example. It's a different, um, it's a different situation. I guess the point is it's not a one-size-fits-all to be uh, overly simplifying that point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, could you explain a little more what you mean by co-design with the business community? Do you mean individual uh, consultations with particular employers or is there a representative group that does it and will therefore uh, be regarded as representing all employers or is it something else? Um, I think it's a bit of all of that. I mean, organisations like the Business Council, organisations like ACI, the Australian Industry Group, the industry bodies are a great place to sort of come and coordinate uh, access to companies and then that can be sort of a way that companies are brought together uh, to assist with, um, uh, you know, designing things, say, like a reporting system. You've also got the Australian Network on Disability. That's a very important uh, body that could be part of this. So I think industry bodies are one vehicle, but sometimes uh, we know from other parts of public policy that getting um, sectors of the economy and getting the actual companies in to say what, what is working, what's not working, uh, that, that also is successful. And making sure that it, it also has to, I think, Commissioner B, very much um, a permanent and continuous dialogue. I think there's far too many things that there's sort of sporadic contact with the business community and then um, people don't sort of talk about it for another three or four years. It has to be that constant dialogue, either through industry bodies or through cohorts of companies so that we're tracking what's working, what's not working, and we can correct it quickly. And is what you are envisaging a system of voluntary adoption by your members of the objectives that you have so clearly set out today? Or are you speaking of something that would be, A, encouraged or B, compelled by government? Well, I think I think that's a matter for governments to, to decide. I think in the first instance, it's, it's important to think about voluntary systems. Um, they often allow problems to be solved without a regulatory environment over the top of them. Um, but it's a matter for governments to decide if they want to regulate some of these things. For example, on the reporting front, that might be open to governments. My only constant plea to governments is to actually kind of do this in tandem with industry so that we're actually tracking the right things and getting it right. Um, but, but, you know, we've certainly done some voluntary things like a voluntary code for paying small business uh, um, more quickly. Now, there's now a reporting arrangement that sits on top of that, which is mandatory. So I think you can do these things sequentially, and they do help you iron out data things. They, they, they help you sort of get systems in place. The really crucial thing, as I've said this morning, is you've, you've got to drive culture change. 
and you've got to drive that um, across the system. That, that leads to my next question, which in a way is a variation of what Commissioner Ryan asked you. If I may say so without uh, upsetting your constituency too much, there is something of a history with certain large corporations of being very good at saying what they should do and not so good at doing it. And we saw that in the Financial Institutions Royal Commission. How do you encourage voluntarily the kind of cultural change you're talking about? It's, it's a, an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, so look, you know, reporting, I think, is the starting point, as we talked about this morning. And there's two ways of doing that. You could have a voluntary reporting arrangement, or you can mandate that. And governments may say, look, you know, it, it is so important that we do this, uh, we're going to mandate that. My only comment, as I've said um, repeatedly this morning, is to do that with industry so you, we're very clear about what we are actually tracking and making sure we're, that we're doing it in a way that, that gets the data that people want. Um, but, but I do think that um, refocusing this debate as an economic and participation one is a really important starting point because... Um, Otherwise, it all does become sort of a bit. The, the risk I feel is that you don't get that culture change. You don't get that that big systems change. So I think there are some things you can do, and these systems don't have to be all of everything. So modern slavery has mandatory reporting, but it was phased in, Chairman, over time. So people got their systems in place. They looked at their supply chains. They worked out. You know how you know how they could set up the systems, how they could track very complex supply chains in other jurisdictions, and then you can sort of escalate as you go forward, particularly as you're starting to look at results and if things aren't improving. Um, so there are there are staged ways as well. So you can start with some voluntary systems and then escalate that up as things, and then you can target it for the things that you believe people should be doing that they're not doing that aren't working. Enlightened self-interest. Absolutely. Adam Smith would be pleased. All right. I'm <laughs> a, I'm a, uh, I'm a um, <laughs> disciple of Adam Smith, Chairman. So, um, But I think it's our national, I think it's also our national interest if I can, you know, go back to that point. I mean, this is really about, you know, a productive participatory and decent society and, and valuing the dignity of a job for every person in the country. Indeed it is. Thank you very much. It's been a most stimulating uh, and uh, interesting uh, session, if I may say so. We're very much indebted to you for the uh, ideas that you've put forward and the explanations that you've provided. So thank you very much for your statement and for the oral evidence you have given today. You've given us a good deal of uh, food for thought, I think. Thank You're you very, very welcome. Much. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, Ms. Eastman, Thank do we you, adjourn now? Mrs. We adjourn uh, for lunch. We're running a little behind time, so if we could resume at 1.15. 1.15, yes. All right, we'll Thank resume you. at 1.15. Thank you very much. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Ben. Thank you, Chair. Um, before we start the next session, I'd like to tender the documents, uh, the statements from this morning. If I could do that in a uh, by listing out the statements as we did yesterday afternoon, uh, there is first the statement of Scott Connolly, dated 4 October 2021, which we propose to ascribe Exhibit Number 19-6. Uh, similarly, there is a statement of Mr Donnelly of 23 September 2021, which we propose to exhibit with the number 19-7, with the attachment. Uh, as 19-7.1. Uh, then the statement of Jennifer Westacott of 25 October 2021 be tendered as document 19-8 with the two attachments to that document being marked 19-8.1 and 19-8.2. Yes, the documents that have been referred to by Ms Bennett will be admitted into evidence and given the exhibit numbers uh, to which she has referred, which are recorded in a document that, uh, for convenience, I'll initial. Thank you. Please, the Chair. Uh, commissioners, we now change direction a little bit and go from laying the groundwork around what the, the law and experience of people with disability is, and we turn now 
to the barriers that people with disability can face from the perspective of the employers. Uh, and to that, to that end, commissioners, we have representatives of each of Kmart, Woolworths and Compass. Just pause there, Chair. I understand that there are representatives of those organisations that would like to announce an appearance. So pause if the Chair is minded to receive those appearances now. Yes, thank you. Uh, if there are appearances, uh, please do announce them uh, now, perhaps starting with Kmart. Uh, the Commission pleases. Uh, my name is Woods and I appear on behalf of Kmart Australia Limited. Thank you, Mr Woods. And then uh, Woolworths. Uh, yes, Madam Pleaser Commission, uh, Stephen Woodbury on behalf of Ms Polanski and Woolworths Group Limited from Ashurst. Yes, thank you. And uh, finally, from C uh, Compass Group. Is there a representative from Compass Group? I'm told there's no uh, appearance from the Compass Group. Very good. Thank you. Um, now, Commissioners, I'll just start by asking the members of this morning's panel to identify themselves and their role, and I'll briefly explain uh, the direction of this panel. So first, uh, Ms Polinsky from Woolworths, can you please identify yourself and tell the Commissioners your name and your role? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Carmel Polanski from Woolworths Group Limited, a Director, Talent and People Capability Practice. Thank you, Ms Polanski. Uh, Mr. Gray from Kmart, could you identify yourself and tell the commissioners your role? Thank you. Um, my name is Tristram Gray and I'm the Chief People and Capability Officer for the Kmart Group. Uh, and Ms. Martin, could you identify yourself to the commissioners and tell them your role? Vanessa Martin and I'm the National General Manager for Diversity and Inclusion for Compass Group Australia. Now, Ms Polumsky, you have provided a statement to this Commission of 15 June 2021, is that right? Yes, it is. Commissioners will find that at folder B, tab 118. And Ms Polumsky, are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are. There have been some changes subsequent to that, which I can note through questions. So, for example, the Endeavour Group is now a separate part of the Woolworths Group. I see. Um, have those corrections been provided separately, do you know, to the solicitors assisting? No. Okay. Well, perhaps we might ask your those um, lawyers working with you to provide those to the solicitors assisting and we will come back and ask you to affirm your statement with those corrections in due course this afternoon, if that's convenient. Uh, Endeavour is now an entirely separate company, isn't it? Correct. It impacts the numbers of people with disability that were stated in our original statement. So when you're appearing today, you're not actually representing Endeavour? No. Correct. Now, Mr Gray, uh, there are two statements from you. The first is dated 18 June 2021 and a supplementary statement of 29 October 2021. Have you read both of those statements, Mr Gray? I have. And when read together, are those statements true and correct? They are true and correct. Commissioners, you'll find those in folder B, tabs 32 and 45, respectively. Yes, thank you. Um, Ms Martin, turning finally to you, you have made, I'm sorry, I, um, you've made a statement of 15 June 2021, which the commissioners will find at folder B, tab 8. Uh, is that right? That's correct, yes. And have you, is the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. Thank you, Ms Martin. Commissioners, um, in public hearing nine, there was evidence given about the barriers faced by people with disability trying to get their first step on the ladder to employment in the course of being recruited into an organisation and then recruited into positions more senior within that organisation. So for this hearing, the Royal Commission asked various public and private sector employers about their recruitment practices and to identify how each addressed those barriers that face people with disability. Kmart, Woolworths and Compass are all companies with a large workforce, the range of qualifications, requirements, and they operate across a broad number of sites in Australia. Uh, and so we're interested to speak to them today about the way in which they go about recruiting people across their organisations and across Australia. With that introduction, can I turn first to Mr Gray 
of Kmart. Is it right that Kmart employs around 42,364 people? Is that about right, as far as you know, Mr Gray? Correct. Yes. And your HR systems record about half a percent of that number have a disability. Is that right? Uh, no, that's not quite correct. Well, what we record today is uh, 671 team members who have some form of disability. That's uh, outlined in point seven of my supplementary statement on the 29th yes. of 2021, which is and roughly 1.58% so of our population. 1.58%. And is that an area that you want to see improvement in, in the rate of people with disability in your organisation? Yes, it is. And uh, indeed, what we've seen since we've upgraded our HR systems uh, and implemented a centralised recruitment uh, approach in July this year, we've seen, in fact, now that we're recording those applications where people identify because we've provided the opportunity for applicants to identify whether they have a disability or indeed may need an adjustment to help them uh, work in our organisation, we've seen 3.8% of those applicants uh, and new hires are identifying with a disability. So we're pleased to see that. But of course, our view as a large employer is we always have more to do in this area. So yes, I would agree with you that we would like to see uh, an increase in people with disability working within our business into the future. And you'd accept that historically the, the rates of employment of disability by your organisation haven't been good enough, have they? Uh, what I would say is that we did not collect that data in a way that would enable us to identify the actual population within our workforce or demographic that did identify with a disability because we didn't ask people to identify whether they had a disability. We only became aware of that if they requested a workplace adjustment or, secondly, were part of a formal uh, disability employment program. So uh, that that would be my my view on that question. So you don't know if you're if you had enough representation of people with disability in the past. Is that fair? I don't think there's anything to suggest that our level of disability would have been any less than what we're seeing now with the system that collects that data. However, I don't have any factual data that I could present to you to say it was at a certain level because we never collected that data in the past. Yes. So, Ms Martin, can I understand from you, you're, uh, you employ about 10,236 people um, and your HR system records just under 2% of those people having a disability. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that consistent with the, the level that Compass would like to see? No, we'd like to see more. And what we have seen, as I provided in my statement over the last 10 years, we've had um, similarly, through disability employment service providers and also existing staff stepping forward as we've run quite a significant campaign to encourage inclusivity in the workplace. And we've had a lot more people choosing to identify as living with a disability. So we've upgraded what we call our payroll, our payroll system, which is Pay Global, to be able to capture that information. Um, we're sure that we probably even have more in the business, but we give it people an alternative to make a personal choice on whether they choose to publicly identify or not. And, and turning to um, Ms Polanski uh, at Woolworths, uh, you employ around 200,000 staff, is that right? Yes. And uh, your HR systems record uh, around 1% as having a disability, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, do you see that as being a level that is good enough? We would absolutely want more people with disability to, to declare um, their disability. Um, in, in an engagement survey that we run where people could um, declare their disability, we actually had a larger number of people um, and it was about 1.5% of our workforce who, who's um, declared a disability, but even so we would want it to be more than that. I think the complexity comes from self-identification um, as well as visible and non-visible disability, but absolutely we would want to do more. We would want to have a, a larger percentage. I just want to be clear about 
um, the position of each of you, just so that I understand the position. Is it the position, starting with you, Ms Polanski, that you believe that there are disabled people with a disability working for your organisation at an acceptable level but you simply haven't counted them? Or is it the case that you accept that you haven't hired enough people with a disability? I'd say it's both. So I think part of the complexity of disability and given it's sometimes visible and sometimes not, um, sometimes people, uh, two people with the same um, uh, disability, some may see it as a disability, some may not. And so it's a more complex issue than simply recording numbers. That said, we would like to uh, remove barriers to employment and hire more people with disability as well. Perhaps I should put that another way. Mr Gray, would you accept that, there, that Kmart has had in place that people with a disability uh, have faced barriers in accessing employment in the past? Do you mean at Kmart? At Kmart, yes. Uh, my, my view would be that I'm sure there have been some people with disability who will have faced uh, difficulty accessing, for example, um, material to apply or the functionality in some of our systems to apply for roles, which is why we've been making changes in those areas to enable greater accessibility. So, yes, I would accept in the past that there no doubt will have been people who have had difficulty accessing uh, roles, um, but we're doing everything we can as we're moving forward now to address those, those issues. And I'll unpack some of those steps you've been taking shortly. Ms Martin, can you respond to that question? Do you except that people with disability have in the past faced barriers in accessing employment with the Compass Group? I would say definitely, and a lot of that is based on accessibility of systems and our recruitment processes. I outlined in my statement that um, given the number of people that we have applying for, you know, the various vacancies that we have from one end of the country, it is electronic and sometimes that could be a barrier in itself. So, again, we've been working with our systems, processes, um, recruiters, um, and trying to set in a whole range of different processes and initiatives to break down those barriers so it's more accessible for people with disability. All right. I'd like to return to those um, and the use of, I think you refer to a low-level AI, and I'd like to discuss how that interacts with people with disability accessing employment with you. But before we do that, I just want to make sure that um, I have identified the correct um, policies and procedures. So, Mr Gray, is it right that you've recently changed most of the policies and procedures that relate to dis re recruitment of people with a disability? I'm sorry, Mr Gray, you're still on mute. Apologies. Uh, yes, I, I would say in, in terms of recruitment, we've changed our recruitment approach to a centralised approach. Previously, we had a decentralised approach, which didn't allow us to track and be consistent in our approach to not only uh, adverts or applications relating to people with disability, but the broader community as a whole. Secondly, we've implemented a new HR information system, which en enables us to one, track this information, but also, uh, importantly, to allow uh, applicants to self-identify at the application stage and conversely, existing team members to retrospectively self-identify should they wish to do so. All right. Now, Ms Polanski, just turning to you, you I'm, as I understand it, Woolworths doesn't presently have specific policies around disability recruitment. Is that right? Um, that is correct. And you have a plan to commence the process to create such a, a, a policy in the financial year of 2022, which would be no earlier than July next year. Is that right? Yes. Well, there are two parts to that. So in terms of the accessibility action plan, that's the piece yes. that's been commenced and will take us 12 to 18 months to formally launch and publish. Um, in terms of the workplace adjustment policy, we have committed to getting that done by July next year. Okay. And you, you, this follows a, um, a review that was done by the Australian Disability Network in 2017 that identified a range of deficiencies in your processes. Isn't that right? 
Correct. Can you explain to the Commission how it is a, an employer of your size has that information for four years before, well, and will be five, before any action is taken about it? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I think there are a number of factors that um, contribute to that. First off, I'd say we have implemented many of the recommendations. So um, just to give a few examples, we do now have... I'm just going to pause there because I, I, I'm just really keen with the limited time that we have just to focus in on, on the specific question that I have, which is a policy around the recruitment of people with a disability is something that was flagged for Woolworths in 2017 as an area of deficiency. Isn't that right? Yes, it was. And that was by an organisation that you engaged specifically to tell you about that. Isn't that right? Yes, it was. And they told you that and you have known since at least that time of the barriers that they identified for you. That's by, all fair. By you, you mean Woolworths because I don't, I'm sorry, I yes. don't think that Ms Polinsky has been there then. And thank you, Chair. Yes, by Woolworths. Yes. Um, and I just, so what I'm really trying to understand or assist the yep. Commission to understand is, is, well, let me go back. You would accept that Woolworths, as an employer of the size that it is, carries additional responsibilities to the Australian community more broadly. You'd accept that? Absolutely. And, and that would include Australians with a disability, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. And so, and so how, how is it in that context that four years after being told of these specific deficiencies, you have not yet taken any step and you don't plan to take any step for a number of months to rectify that deficiency? I think we have taken steps. Um, I think we now have a statement on our career website that specifically says, do we employ people with disability? And the answer is yes, and we absolutely encourage people with disability to apply. And I think we've taken a range of other steps um, that have created and are part of creating a generally inclusive culture. Um, I, I recognise, you, you know, I, I won't go into all of those right now, but I would say that's part of what we've done is started implementing part of the, part of the recommendations. We haven't gone I think I think you were asked about a specific recommendation, so I wonder if you'd direct your attention to the question that Council asked and respond to that. If you wish, Ms Bennett will repeat the question. Sure. We, we do not have at this stage a specific recruitment policy for people with disability. And can I take it from your answer that nor do you have a proper explanation for why there is no such policy? I, I feel like I'm trying to give context to that um, and I appreciate you want a concise answer. So I'm trying to explain the complexity of the large scale, the COVID context where we've had to pivot on some things and the way in which we're trying to create um, a number of steps to encourage people with disability to apply. So while I recognise there's not a policy around employing people with disability, I would say that nonetheless, Woolworths has taken a number of steps to encourage people and to remove barriers. So I'd, I'd say both are true. Have the steps worked? We have shown that since 2016, the number of people with disability who have worked at Woolworths is, in, is increasing. So we would believe it is working. And we, you know, we would say there's more to do. Increase from what to what? Um, I can say that at the moment it's 1%, and prior to 2016, we weren't measuring it. Um, I don't have the exact increase. Mm. And just to, I think, I'll just read from your statement and see if this is accurate. You say Where? internal data shows that since two... Where are we? Sorry, oh, but sorry it's... They're not number parrots. In response no, to question four on page four, yes, thank you. internal data shows that since 2016, the employment of people who self-identify as having a disability has gradually increased at Woolworths and now formally represents around 1% of our team. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, and can I also, while we are at your statement, just uh, verify this, that you referred earlier to a statement that you now include for potential candidates. Is that the statement that we find extracted under question nine at the bottom of paginated? Let's um, take the numbers at the top right. Zero, 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 seven, the numbers at the top. Disregard that as page seven. Right? 
Yes, page seven. So do you employ people with a disability? And then it says, yes, Woolworths Limited yes. encourages and supports. Yes. I had one question about that while we're there. Yeah. It says, if you have a disability or you're, you work for an agency representing a potential employee with a disability, please specify this in your application. Why do you ask people to specify their disability in the application? It would help us to ensure a better recruitment process and or onboarding process should they need any adjustments. Um, you don't otherwise identify the availability of adjustments as part of that process, do you? No, not at the stage, but at, through our Accessibility Action Plan, we plan to address that. I see. Now, um, Ms Martin, turning to you, you've identified some 14 policies that um, you've told us are concerned with the employment of people with a disability. I just want to ask you, is the, are the two key documents from a recruitment perspective, and I'd just like to be clear that I accept that they are all relevant to an extent, but are the key documents the hiring manager essentials pre-course and the Hiring Manager Essential Training Companion Guide. Are they the two key documents for recruitment? They are for recruitment managers and recruiters to deal with things like unconscious bias, but needing to make necessary adjustment if someone steps forward and identifies that they have some form of disability that they're living with. So we modify our recruitment practice to incorporate any adjustments we need. But, you know, critic... Sorry. No, please, go on. Critically, we do have a disability participation policy and we do have a workplace adjustments policy that we use um, along with those. So there's a suite of tools that our recruiters and managers can use when we're um, both um, identifying and onboarding people with disability into the workplace and the recruitment process. Is that workplace adjustments policy... Um, that's a 2020 document uh, that is annexed to your statement at, and it's document CGA.999.0001.0088, which is... Yes. Yes. Can I... Um, I have... A, while we're talking about that document, that's a document that is relevant to um, the recruitment phase of a person... Entering the, the Compass Group can be? It can be, yes. And uh, what happens is, um, as I mentioned in my statement, we have an electronic onboarding um, application process. Yes. What we do is we encourage um, applicants um, to identify at that front end whether they need any adjustments to our recruitment process. So normally you would go on, you would lodge your application electronically, we do give a uh, scope in there for people to do a video interview as well. That's pre-screened by a recruiter at the other end. As I'm, I'm as going well to come as, to the... I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I just, wanted, I just had a very quick question about that document. Do you have that yeah. document in front of you? Yes, I do. Could you just go to the second page of that document? Mm -hmm. And after the three dot points under the heading communicating the procedure, I don't need this to be brought up on screen. I'll just read it out. It's a short sentence. It says, interviewing managers and recruiters use their initiative to ask only successful candidates whether they need workplace adjustments. Is that consistent with the way that that process is intended to work? No, sometimes it can happen at the front end. So It um, would need to happen at the front end, wouldn't it? Yes, yes. But this is referring directly to once they've been offered employment and they're going into the workplace... Um, whether they need any workplace adjustments to say it up front. But when we're doing the recruitment process and the training uh, packs for our recruiters that you mentioned before at the beginning of your questions, we also ask them there whether they need some adjustments. So it's hit on a variety of different fronts, even though the wording on this could be better, better um, reflected. To yes, to capture you'd that. accept that could yeah. be better expressed. Is that yes, fair? Yes, yes, yes. Good. And that's a document that perhaps when you told the well, sorry, I, I understood your evidence to be that this was a document that was relevant to the recruitment stage, but perhaps it's yes. less relevant to that stage and more relevant to after a person is employed. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Okay, I'd like to now just track uh, a person, a candidate's journey to become an employee of your organisation. So I'm going to start with um, the way in which someone uh, knocks on the door, if I can put it that way. Uh, and I understand, so I just want to understand the way that that happens for each of your organisations very briefly, if that's okay. So first of all, Mr Gray, um, you said that until recently you had a decentralised recruitment model. Does that involve um, a CV being dropped off at the store for the attention of the store manager, and which is then considered by that person? In, in simple terms, correct. That was the old system, correct. And then for head office roles, if I can put it that way, that was a more centralised HR-governed process? Yes, and an online process uh, majority. And is it fair that graduate recruitment was a third process again? Yes, that's correct. Yes, okay. So um, you've, your statement tells us that under that decentralised model, there was no set content for an advertisement for a job with Kmart and that in consequence there was no requirement to advertise or to make express the availability of adjustments. Is that right? Historically, yes, prior to this year, that, that was the case. It was a more generic statement that related and reflected our approach and philosophy to diversity and inclusion and wanting to represent the communities in which we worked, including uh, people with a disability, but it did not, as you quite rightly point out, uh, reflect anything specifically in relation to adjustments. But there was nothing about the decentralised nature of the model that made it difficult or impossible for Kmart to include that statement, was it? No, I, I, no, that's correct. I think it's probably reflective of the journey that we've been on over the last few years because that has now been incorporated into the way we now recruit and the statements we make in our application process. So we've, we're learning all the time and, and we accept that we need, we need to continue to learn and we need to do more. But I would suggest to you that it's, it's a result of progression in this area that we're making that we've now adopted. Uh, and you're, Sorry. Are you, are you satisfied that now you've got the necessary statements in your advertisements in that centralised model? I'm satisfied we do. I believe, however, we do have more work to do to make sure they're used consistently. So we're in that transition phase at the moment because we've implemented this new system in July this year. So we're in the process of removing the old and replacing it with the new as we advertise roles. So uh, that we're in transition, but, yes, I'm confident we've got the, the pillars and the architecture and the statements correct now. And Part um, of that was... Who... Sorry, Oh, sorry. Who is who is accountable for that, Mr Gray? Uh, there are two areas that are accountable for that. One is our recruitment function and the second is our dis head of disability and inclusion and they're working together on that. Um, I'm sorry, was the first one a job title? Uh, sorry, no, that was our head, I guess at the end of the day, our head of recruitment who reports to yes. me. So I guess at the end of the day, it's me. Um, yes. But, but uh, there, there are two people who work for me. One takes care of recruitment. Uh, across the company and the other takes care of diversity and inclusion. Those two are charged with bringing that together under my accountability. And so I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but are you the person that is accountable for delivering what you're saying will be delivered? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And so if the Royal Commission were to return in a year, you're, you're satisfied and, and ask you these questions again, you'd be satisfied that they would be as you would want them to be? Absolutely. Yes. Now, um, so you're, you're uh, based in Perth, is that correct? No, I'm based in Melbourne, Commissioner. Based in Melbourne. Your uh, address is given as West Farmers Perth, but that's not where you're based. That's not where I'm based. It's because West Farmers is the overarching and owning company that owns. Uh, yes, I, under I understand that. That's why I asked. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, Ms. Polanski, turning to you again, um, I'd like to just understand. So, I'm sorry, Mr. Gray, before I leave you, I just want to understand under the current model, how does somebody lodge an application with Kmart? Multiple ways uh, and multiple options to do that. They can apply directly online, they yes. can visit a store, and they would be able to use a QR code to then apply through the store, um, or they may submit. A, uh, an unsolicited uh, CV through to our uh, Kmart Careers uh, website as well. And 
with the online application, does the person need to create a profile and go through a number of steps? Yes, that's correct. And has that been assessed from an accessibility perspective for people with a disability? Yes, we have. In fact, it's called an applicant tracking system, ATS. Um, and what we've done is we've made a number of changes in, in putting that system in as we've centralised. So a couple of those examples I can give you would be in relation to dyslexia font. So that helps uh, applicants who may be affected by dyslexia read our documents uh, more easily and be able to uh, input uh, material into the system. Second is keyboard navigation, which is has focus indicators uh, to guide the applicant through the platform if they have difficulty uh, seeing those. Third would be high contrast colours, uh, which make it easier for those uh, applicants who may have low vision or are vision impaired to, to see the material. Um, and the last piece that we're doing is we're developing a mobile app now to enable people to apply on any device from anywhere, um, and that content will be compliant with the web content accessibility guidelines, um, and we expect that to be available in 2022. All right. Now, um, Ms Polunsky, can I ask you about um, the process for applying for a job at Woolworths? Can I just be clear, I'm excluded from this, um, the graduate recruitment stream, uh, and I'd like to focus on your largest employee pool, which I take it is your store staff. Is that right? Yes. Um, and I think you tell us in your statement that applicants need to create an online profile to complete a job application. Is that right? That's one way they can come in. Um, okay. Yeah. What, what are the other ways? Um, so we work with a range of DES providers who they have... I'll just pause there, sorry. I'm going to... I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I am going to just um, leave the DES um, uh, okay. recruitment model for now. That's the subject of another hearing. So I'll just uh, stick with what we might... Um, the, the, what I think is called in your statement the mainstream recruitment model. And so in that context, how, do, how does an applicant identify themselves to you? Yes, so they would apply um, either online or if there was a referral, um, they would um, be able to submit a, a CV in person to the, the person they, they knew. Um, so with the online application, the person needs to create a profile uh, before they can submit an application. Is that right? Yes, yes. And, and again, my question for you, Ms Polanski, is is that been tested and considered from a disability accessibility perspective? I think that's part of what we need to do as we continue to improve the accessibility. I think that that's absolutely right. So that hasn't happened yet? No. Okay. Now, um, once a person has submitted their application, they've created a profile and submitted the application, where does it go from there? Um, we also have an ATS, and so um, it then gets allocated appropriately to various recruiters who work with our store teams. So we have a team that specifically recruits for our stores. I'm sorry, you used an acronym there that I wasn't familiar with. Um, think... It's the applicant tracking system. Sorry, the same one that Mr Gray referred to. Okay, so... Does, that, does an application go to a third party for assessment, or for, for automatic assessment? Not to my knowledge. Okay, so it goes to what's the role of the recruitment agency in that then? Sorry, it goes to the, um, it's a system um, called Success Factors. That's the applicant tracking system, but that's held within Woolworths. I see. And then how does, the, how does that um, application get assessed within Woolworths? Um, through the recruiters. So there's a team of store recruiters who would then look at those online applications and make judgments about what to progress or not. Okay. And they are employees of Woolworths who are based in particular stores or are they centrally part of your HR group? It's central part of the HR group. Okay. So have they had... So you don't use any um, artificial intelligence screening process as part of your recruitment? We have one, um, two separate ones that are being piloted at the moment, but none okay. is in the mainstream recruitment at this stage. Yes, and so are they part of your recruitment process at the moment? They are as a pilot, um, I think for Christmas, I, I think for Christmas recruitment. I can I check that. I see. So at the moment there are, if, for mainstream store recruitment, there is uh, an application Online that is considered by HR staff 
Are, yeah. are they centrally located? Yes. Um, yes. Brisbane. Brisbane, I see. And then another option is um, someone drops off a CV if they have a referral. And how does one get a referral? If, well, if they know someone or if they're going to store and they want to ask, uh, I'm talking about, I guess, not online, there's always the opportunity for someone to walk into a store and say, I'd like to speak to the manager or the assistant manager or I know someone who works here. And so some recruitment happens that way as well. I'm just interested in that referral piece. Is it okay to just walk in off the street and hand in your CV? Into a store, yes. Yes, yes. yes. I understand. And then the third, I guess, stream is um, once you've applied online, um, there'll be an AI for some Christmas casual position, it, it seems, there's an artificial intelligence process that screens out or some people. Is that right? There's a pilot going on at the moment that we're using through the Christmas recruitment process. And is it part of that pilot, whether or not the algorithm being applied by that artificial intelligence uh, is sensitive to issues that might arise for people with disability? Yes, I think um, one of the factors we want to consider is um, inclusion broadly, so disability, but as well as, you know, does it um, provide fair access to people from First Nations, LGBTQ+, women, female talent, etc. So I think we are applying a broad lens to the degree to which through the pilot it demonstrates um, that it's the right uh, system for us. Is that something that you will factor into your assessment of that system going forward? Absolutely. Yes. And so, again, if we come back to you in a year, we'll be able to discuss with you the way Absolutely. in which that's been factored in. Thank you. Turning to um, uh, Ms Martin, can you tell us about the way that you tell people that there are jobs available with Compass. So I think it's fair that you tell us in your statement that you don't advertise the availability of adjustments for applicants. Is that right? Yeah, we don't put that on the advert, advert but we do um, have an inclusive statement on our, on our job adverts that encourage people to apply. Um, is it a matter of concern that people might not apply because they think there aren't adjustments available? We try and use, I guess, three different mechanisms. One is we can take a direct referral where somebody walks in off the street, hands us a CV, tells them about themselves and wants to apply for any available vacancies with us. So that's number one. Number two is they could go online through our electronic portal and do this electronic application process, which does have a low-level AI uh, part to it that screens applications. Um, what happens is you also do a video interview of yourself as well and lodge it, and our recruiter at the other end will analyse that and come back to you. And if you identify yourself as living with a disability, they will make direct contact with you and ask you what type of adjustments that you would need to be onboarded or come through our recruitment process. The Just third, to pause there, I'm sorry, yeah. my, my question was a little bit narrower than that. My okay. question is, do you have any concern that by not mentioning the availability of adjustments, people might think they're not available? That could possibly happen, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not sure because I haven't got any trending on it, but I'd imagine that that would be the case. Yes. You say in your statement, paragraph 10, that the physical inherent requirements are specified when required specifically for a role. Who identifies yes. what those inherent requirements are? So we have many contracts with many clients and particularly a large portion of our operations sit in the mining and resource sector and people need to do medicals and, you know, there's physical requirements associated with various roles. And so whatever the vacancy is and if it's relevant to that, it would specify that up front. It's probably a good minutes. moment, um, Ms Martin, for me to clarify the nature of Compass's business. It, it's, okay. As I understand, it's not a labour hire business, but you do provide staff to other entities. Can you explain the way that your model? So we have, we have multiple business sector brands um, and they have different, what would I call it, almost like badging or marketing attached to them. We would do everything from offshore flotels and platforms 
out in the East Timor Sea with Conoco Phillips, right through to running um, a small cafe at a university. So there's things like aged care, hospitals, um, mining sector villages with various clients, um, floatels, platforms I mentioned before, private schools. So there's a raft of different contracts and different roles attached to those contracts. So just to clarify, um, if a, a school needs cafeteria staff, yes, staff who are employed by Compass will enter the school and provide those services in the school, but yes. they continue to be employed by you. Yes. And the reason that the inherent requirements are sometimes identified by the client, if I can put it that way, is because they're the ultimate recipient of the services. Is that right? That's true. And sometimes, depending on the nature of the contract and the type of service that we're delivering, many of our clients have very rigorous safety requirements yes. that they would want us to adhere to with our staff. And does Compass apply an independent mind to the appropriateness of those requirements, those inherent obligations? Or does it just um, accept them from their client? We accept them from our client and many of them have gone through some very rigorous health and safety processes to determine what they are, yeah. So, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the answer to my question. Does Compass apply an independent mind to whether or not the things identified by the client are actually inherent requirements for the role? Not that I'm aware of. I would, I would need to check that because some contracts might be different. Thank you. So Compass's policies then would be very heavily affected by the perceptions of your clients as to what the inherent requirements of a particular job might be? It, it can. It can be. Um, but then we also, as the primary employer, would have some require, requirements around what we need employment-wise and physically from um, our staff as well to conduct different roles and functions in different positions, to be a combination I, of both. I, I infer, and tell me if I'm wrong, that your reference to the stringent health and safety requirements of your customers often translates into the unsuitability of people with disability to be sent to that particular client to perform the work they have in mind. It can if the nature of the disability doesn't match the kind of role and function, there could be an issue there. If it was, if it was somebody, uh, for example, um, what would I give an example of, that might have some type of physical um, disability that impacts on a safety issue. Um, uh, an example I'm trying to think of might be related to sight, um, when you're on, if you're, you know, um, visually impaired and you would need to go to a particular remote uh, mining operation and there could be a variety of different hazards in that workplace, that may be an issue that our client, if you don't meet a safety requirement to be there, would say they wouldn't grant access to that site or that operation to work in that particular role if that's going to impact on a safety issue. But you take the assessment of the client as to whether the disability will have an impact upon the safety requirement? No, because what we do is um, we're aware of the innate risk issues for different roles and we, we have a system internally called Compass Care which work with our recruitment staff around the nature of different roles and different operations and different con contracts um, in, in the inherent requirements of a role. Um, so we have that internally when we're onboarding somebody and they might need to go through um, a medical or a fitness examination to meet the inherent requirements of a position, we do all of that internally. And we have a number of what you call um, health and safety um, employees that work with Compass College, oh, sorry, Compass Care, um, who would make sure that we're not setting somebody up for failure into a role that um, could create some physical hazards or problems for them. Thank you. But 
as the employer, you're, you're aware that you have obligations yourself under yes. the Disability Discrimination Act and otherwise not yes. discriminate on the basis of disability. Yes. And so you would need to, wouldn't you, yourself consider uh, whether there are being any limitations on or any, any inherent requirements applied as a filter yourself, yes. wouldn't you? Yes, yes. yes. And, and is there and evidence we're... that you do that? Yes, we're aware of, um, I mentioned at the front end that there's three different mechanisms that somebody with a disability could present to us proactively looking for employment. So it could be through a portal, it could be direct, or it could be through a disability employment service provider. We do a lot of work up front with the candidate around um, overcoming those barriers. So we have... Um, up front a number of people that do work in our resource sector space and with our different clients who identify as having some form of disability. Um, we've got a whole raft of different examples of those disabilities and we don't see it as a barrier, but what we want to do, and it's a part of making employment effective, is to make sure that we're not setting people up for failure or putting them in a situation that could be hazardous. So it's about that negotiation at the front end on the job match and the role um, for the person involved. All right, we, we might return to that if we have time. I'd like to turn for a moment to attitudes in recruitment. Now, this commission has heard evidence this week about what we talk about as unconscious bias or attitudes that can present a barrier for people with a disability. So I'd like to ask a few questions around that, that topic. Now, um, Mr Gray, you, you provided the, the Royal Commission with a disability recruitment resource pack. It's at bundle B, tab 43 for the commissioners. Before I ask you questions about that specific document, Mr Gray, can I just ask you, do you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about unconscious bias? I do. Can you tell the commissioners what you understand that concept to mean in the context of disability recruitment? Forming, it, it could be a person uh, looking to employ someone forming an opinion about what they believe uh, are the requirements or the needs for that role and making decisions uh, summarily or arbitrarily uh, without considering what either adjustments or the person's ability rather than their disability uh, could provide in the case of disability. Um, but it may also be in relation to race, ethnic background, uh, cultural background, religion, et cetera, where people form stereotypical views, uh, often that affect negatively uh, per, in an employment context, the employment of that individual. All right. I, I'd like in that context to take you to the first substantive page of this document. This is a document that you provide to those who are uh, store managers and to those who provide process tools and support in recruitment. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Now, I'd like to just take you to this part. This is the first substantive page under the heading introduction, and this is where you tell your store managers that some of the legal actions that can arise from managing people with a disability could include actions under the Fair Work Act. I won't read the balance. Federal and state territory anti-discrimination laws, state and territory occupational health and safety laws, state and territory workers' compensation or accident compensation laws. Can you explain, Mr Gray, why managing a person with a disability can give rise to an action under, for example, state and territory anti-discrimination laws? If a manager either made a decision uh, to hire or not, or in the case maybe not hire someone because they had a disability, they would be in breach of a number of those uh, pieces of legislation. So I'm just going to direct you back to what the document says. This is, you're telling managers who are managing people with disability that doing so could, in, um, that a legal action that could arise from managing people with disability can include an anti-discrimination lawsuit. Why are you telling your managers that? What we're reminding them of there is about that if we don't uh, manage things in a way that doesn't present unconscious bias or real bias, then we run the risk of running foul 
of laws that apply uh, in the country. So it's more about guiding people to un they understand the implications of not managing this well, not managing it carefully, and not being attuned to their obligations and responsibilities. Uh, well, Mr Gray, you'd agree with me that that's not what that says, isn't it? I would agree with you that it could be phrased differently in that regard, but I, I would suggest to you and I would say to you that is not the intent that we're trying to create or the suggestion that you're making is not the intent we're trying to create. I understand that, but you have, I would suggest to you, hundreds of store managers, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And um, hundreds more assisting them as assistant managers or in staff recruitment roles, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so hundreds of people in your organisation are provided with this document to help them understand what they need to do to hire people with a disability. Is that, is that fair? Yes, that's fair. And on the first page, you're telling them that managing people with a disability, that legal actions that can arise from managing people with disability could include actions under anti-discrimination laws. Isn't it the case that managing a person with a disability gives rise to no risk of an anti-discrimination lawsuit without the discrimination? I think with respect, there's two, two aspects or two positions I put to you around that. One is this first page needs to be read within the context of the entire document. Yes. The, first that. the, the second piece would be to say that if our managers ran foul or, or um, conducted themselves in a way that did breach any of those pieces of legislation, then a, a, that would give rise to a, to a claim. So we're reminding our managers of their responsibilities and the risks of not performing those responsibilities in a professional and compliant manner with the laws and, uh, in, the, in the country. And do you remind them about that when thinking about hiring women or gay and lesbian people? Or people Absolutely. who are pregnant? Absolutely. Uh, we, and where do we find that in your materials, in, in your policies? Do you have policies that say when hiring women, you need to be aware of the risk of anti-discrimination lawsuits? We have, anti, we have bullying and anti-harassment policies. We, we talk about that in a number of different areas, about not only this piece of legislation, but all pieces of legislation, where there happens to be safety and the risks that an individual puts themselves at, but also the company at risk, if they don't comply with the relevant legislation in the particular area that they're operating with. So I just want to be really clear on your evidence. So you, you tell your managers that there are legal actions that can arise from managing women, which could include state, um, federal and state territory anti-discrimination laws. No, I think what I'm saying is that we remind managers of obligations under various pieces of jurisdiction that exist uh, in, in the country in relation to employment laws. I think you're accepting that uh, that might be a good idea to reframe this paragraph to say what is meant. I, I do accept that, Commissioner. Yes. When was this uh, document prepared? It seems to be undated. Uh, I believe, I, I would have to check to be 100% correct, but I believe it was either 2020 or 21. But I, I'm, I'll, I would have to come back to you, Commissioner. It, it refers on page 11 to application forms being in a 2016 format but I wasn't otherwise able to date it other than beyond 2016. But I did make the assumption that it was part of the 2020 changes that you refer to in your statement. I believe so, but I, I would have to, to be absolutely sure, um, for the absence of doubt, I'd have to come back to you and confirm. And the Disability and Accessible Action Plan, financial year 21, which is yes. uh, next to your statement, uh, when was that prepared? Uh, that, that was prepared in 2020 because financial year 21 runs from, obviously, July 2020 through. And what prompted these the preparation of these documents? Uh, it was part of our increased focus on employing people with disability uh, because we set ourselves some targets around, and I appreciate Council Assisting doesn't want to talk about the DES process here, but we set ourselves targets around that. What we have is a four pillar uh, strategy around. No, I don't know what. I'm just wanting to know what prompted it. What oh. prompted? What prompted the company's interest in uh, directing attention to the employment of people with disabilities? Yes, 
Yes, we, we felt it was an area where we could do more. And secondly, we felt that we want to be an employer and we do want to be an employer that reflects the communities in which we're working. And we felt there was a requirement to step out and be clear about the actions we were taking to increase the employment and the retention, importantly, of people with disability within our organisation. And that prompted this plan. Yes, I'm sure someone formed that view. I'm just trying to understand what prompted it. Was it a... Uh something that just occurred to someone or was it the result of an inquiry or was it the result of some other stimulus that uh, might have uh, influenced Kmart or West Farmers, as the case may be, to uh, take an interest in disability? I, I believe, from a Kmart perspective at least, it was an interest of a previous, prior to my time, previous managing director had raised the question in regards to what we were doing in this area. And I believe that was the genesis of this discussion some years ago. Mm, thank you. All right. Um, Ms Martin, I want to return to the application process that we were discussing earlier. You were telling us about the online um, method by which you receive applications quite often, and that, I understand from your statement, particularly relates to the high-volume entry-level roles that Compass has. So you, you get a significant portion of applicants through what you describe as um, high-volume entry-level entry roles. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And you tell us, that, and so what is the process that a person needs to go through to get their application to you? They can either hand it to us directly. So we have a diversity and inclusion unit with several staff members that work directly with disability employment service providers. So we proactively seek applications from people with disability, or you can go online and apply um, put an electronic application and put all your details on our recruitment system. Uh, what happens is through that process, you can identify yourself as having a disability and the recruiter at the other end that will get that information off that system will contact you direct to ask if you need any adjustments around your um, selection process. Going right. So just to pause at the electronic application stage, is that mm -hmm. a process that's been assessed for its um, accessibility for people with disability? Yes. So our careers page is web content, um, content accessible um, on the 2.0 compliance. Um, we are checking that. We also include inclusive statements on the actual electronic adverts. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had that accessibility piece sitting in that system. And I think you tell us that um, there's a hotline for applicants to call at the start yes. of the process. Is that right? Does that go yes, to your recruitment is. Yes, staff? it does. Yes, it does. Yes. And I understand your staff have received disability training. Is that your recruitment staff? Yes. So our, our recruitment staff do um, the hiring essentials pre-course uh, they're included in that are things around unconscious bias um, and being aware of um, how you can be accessible to draw the best talent through. Um, so, um, you know, making sure that the wording, how they approach people, all of that sort of stuff is appropriate. Um, just to pause there, can I just ask, uh, I understand a reasonably significant portion of your hiring staff have received that training. Are you able to tell the Royal Commission what level of disability confidence training your staff have received? When I lodged this, um, my statement, I think off the top of my head, it was around about 150 of our key um, leaders and people working in our HR and recruitment areas had been, um, had undertaken it. But if you're a recruiter, the two yeah. modules that I provided around um, the higher management essentials, um, yes. training is a requirement that all of the recruitment staff have to go through as a part of their professional development and the area that they work in. So is that everyone who is going to be assessing CVs yes. have all yes. had a degree of training? Yes. And who provides that training? Uh, we do it internally. We have an academy and we put people through internal training. We also work closely with the Australian Network on Disability as a platinum member and we um, get external peak bodies to come in and give us advice. And depending on the nature of disability, we can also draw on the strengths of 
Autism WA and other providers that specialise in a, a particular area of disability to talk to our staff about appropriate approaches and the way Mr. to handle Gray, different candidates. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms Martin. Mr Gray, what proportion of Kmart's hiring staff have had disability training? I'm sorry, I think you're on mute again, Mr Gray. Apologies. Uh, for that. Um, would have thought From I Miss would, Melbourne, uh, Mr Gray, we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Um, um, our, our people in capability team has been trained as the operational uh, business partners out in the field as well as in, in our national office, as well as our recruitment team have all been trained. The other teams, I'd say, is all the store managers uh, have been taken through, and I think it's on page 13 of my initial statement, the uh, disability awareness and targeted disability Awareness employment training has gone to store leadership teams. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to slow down. The interpreters will oh, find that they're very difficult. Uh, no, can I just go back to make sure I, I think I missed something at the start. So, can you just tell us again, you, you, who has undertaken disability specific training that relates to recruitment? Our, our recruitment team. Yes, and how and, many people is that? Uh, there's approximately. 16 or 17 people in that team. And then, so how many people are involved in carrying out Kmart's recruitment task? Uh, then those, those recruiters, uh, but of course then there is line managers and store managers um, across the nation who are involved in that, both in our national office, but also out in our store and distribution uh, centre network. And those people who are involved in uh, that hiring process are required to go through the training uh, around uh, disability awareness training um, that's, that's rolled out to those team members in order for them to execute on their duties around that. In addition to, as we've previously talked about, the recruitment pack uh, that's there as well. Yes, it's in the, in the materials. So... Um... Is it the case that everyone who's assessing a CV for a job in a store has carried out a form of disability recruitment training? To the best of my knowledge. Yes. Ms Polanski, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, have you, do, do your recruitment staff have disability recruitment training? Um, we conducted such training for 28 of our staff in 2019, but beyond that, um, not on a consistent basis. And so the people carrying out the hiring at the moment haven't received that training? Not that training, no. And you'd agree with me that it's well within Woolworth's capability to do that, isn't it? Um, yes, and if I, if I could, um, the, the last year and a half we've had to pivot and, and pause a lot of training um, due to our essentially, I guess, um, feeding the nation through COVID. And so a lot of our training has been on pause. We're also carrying out training on learning and reconciliation for First Nations people. And so there is a degree around um, the amount of training we can push through our system at any one point. Do I think we would like to, over time, ensure everyone recruiting people with disabilities had that training? I do. And just so I understand, is it is it your evidence that but for... COVID, you would have completed that task or is that another factor into why that hasn't taken place? I think it's another factor that has impacted our general training schedule. Yes, I see. Um, Ms Martin, returning to you, I um, am intrigued by your low-level AI and the extent to which it has programmed into it the capacity to identify um, bias or uh, identify disability specific needs. Do you, are you aware if it has been audited or reviewed for that purpose? No, I'm not aware of that. But I can say that when somebody identifies on that system as having a disability, they would get a direct contact from us. We don't rely purely and solely on that system filtering people in or out of our recruitment process. So a person with a disability who was disadvantaged by that system, mm -hmm. how would they know they were at a disadvantage? They wouldn't. 
and they wouldn't, wouldn't know either. Wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't show them whether they're in or they're out. You would go online, you yes. would log your application, it would go through the portal, and our recruitment team at the other end would be looking at who's applied. Everybody that applies and uploads their profile goes onto our system, which is called PageUp. And there's and a box that you tick in there if you choose to identify. And does everyone who ticks that box uh, obtain a phone call or is it just those who say that they require an adjustment for the interview? No, they would, they would get a contact from us, yes. Okay. And the box is, I'm sorry, the box is that the person has a disability or that they yeah. require an adjustment? Yeah, that's that they have a disability, it doesn't ask them what type of disability they have. It just says, do you identify as a person living with a disability? Thank you. And then mm. I think you tell us in your statement that there is an interview process, a video interview process. Is yes. that automated or is that a live person? Um, it's automated. So you would record yourself and um, answer a series of questions and tell us about yourself. There's a guide there and that you would upload that on that portal. And so there's a series of questions that are printed or that are on the screen and you record yourself answering them? Yes. And then that goes to a central place? Yeah, to us, a central recruitment, yeah, here. Okay. And the recruiters who review that, they're part of your team that have undertaken disability yes. training that we just talked about? I said. Yes, so they would have um, the disability confidence training and also that what we call our hiring manager essentials. They're considering considered hiring managers, so they go through an essentials training program. And there's an opportunity, you said, for somebody to opt out of that process. Is that the box ticking at the earlier step? Yes, so people may or may choose to identify or not identify. All right. Um, now, I'd like to ask about the question of disclosure of a disability. And um, starting with you, Ms. Polanski, I think I asked you at the start about um, whether or why Woolworths asked applicants to disclose their disability. Do you have a view about um, gathering the data on disability and how that can be effectively done? Is that something that Woolworths has considered? Yes, it is, and it's something we're putting our mind to now. Um, we're conscious that disability, um, and, and look, I'm no privacy lawyer, but I understand that it would fall under health, um, sensitive health matters, and therefore we're particularly thoughtful and sensitive about asking our team members um, for that information. Um, what we are considering is actually an expression of interest uh, going out to team members who would like to um, disclose, um, and that's something we're, we're looking at at the moment. Um, it, it is a, um, a sensitive and complex issue for us. Yes. Well, can I ask you, Ms Martin, have you considered that issue internally at Compass? Is the question about how to ask for or to track data in this space something that's been considered by you? Yes, it is. And we've relied um, heavily on speaking to, you know, our partner like is in Australian Network on Disability, we're cognizant of the privacy and the sensitivity attached to it and that it becomes an individual's choice whether they disclose or don't disclose. Um, our view is that we do not collect specific information on the types of disability that people have, right? We um, just say, do you identify or don't you? And we try and record that because we do have targets set for the number of people with disability that we want to employ on a national basis across all of our operations. We try to track and monitor that the numbers that we are onboarding um, across the country so that we can give feedback to respective um, operational managers about how they're travelling on meeting those KPIs and their performance agreements. But we don't want to breach that privacy piece. So there's a fine line that you walk. And anecdotally, off the top of my head, I would say that we have a lot more people in our system that do have a disability but choose not to identify. 
Well, just to pause there, you mentioned your targets. That, um, can you tell the Royal Commission precisely what your targets are? We have a minimum of 50 placements per annum that we would like to achieve across the country. And, for example, in this, our last financial year of 2021, which is our, you know, we work on a British financial year that ends in September, we onboarded 112 people who identified as having disability. So we, we, we met our target by what is it, 224%. And is that a recruitment target, as I understand it? Um, no, it sits across our operations and we encourage our operational managers to be proactive about um, encouraging people with disability to work with us. And... Um do you have targets at different levels? Are you looking to make sure that you have people with disability in leadership roles in certain numbers, for example? Yes, when I talk about how we identify those that choose to want to step forward and say they have a disability or they're living with a disability, we track on our, our payroll system what levels of management they're in, if they're professional, if they've got a trade background or if they're in, in entry-level roles because... Another piece to our whole recruit, um, disability recruitment and onboarding is that talent development pipeline, and we like to see diversity move across the system, both vertical and horizontal movement. And so do you have a specific target for people with disability above a certain level within the organisation? No, we just, we just have a baseline one as a minimum target to onboard 50 per So you can, you can fulfil your target with um, your high volume, low level recruits or you can fill it with senior executives. That would yes. all count. Yes. yes. I see. Um, Ms. Plutsky, do you, um, well, first of all, do you have any targets for the recruitment of people with disability? Not at the stage, no. Has Woolworths considered using them? Yes, it's something we are thinking about as we put together our accessibility action plan and also getting some guidance from the Australian Network of Disability who's working with us on that. Yes. And, and is that, can I suggest, informing your consideration of the data point that we talked about before? Absolutely. Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it, to have targets without having a, a meaningful way of tracking whether you're meeting them? Yeah, and, I, you know, I, I think um, there's absolutely intent to increase wherever possible the number of people we employ with disability and to remove barriers. Um, I think, you know, even from everything I'm hearing today, it's, it's not a simple process. And I think we're sensitive to that and we want to deal with it sensitively. We take inclusion as a strategy very seriously at Woolworths and we're putting a lot of thought into it. So um, I don't have a quick, simple answer, but absolutely we are considering it all and, and trying to get as much as fast as we can on it. It would have been equally unsimple if uh, football worse had started five years ago, wouldn't it? Well, I think we've always employed people with disability and we're working on a range of areas. So I, I it's just... Very difficult to see, it's very difficult to see that from your statement. You don't collect any information on the uh, applications for adjustments. You don't know how many there have been. They're dealt with at a state level. There's no... Uh, coordination at a national level. This is pretty basic material, isn't it? Well, if I may, I think there are also some wonderful examples in our statement of activity that's happening across the business. And I think what we... To, that's not what point, I'm asking. Sorry, that's not what I'm asking you about. You, you, the question you was, have, do we you, take... You have it previ you, sorry, you have previously been asked questions and then you respond by saying, but we're doing terrific things elsewhere. Would you mind just concentrating? I find it difficult to understand how an organisation like Woolworths uh, wouldn't even be compiling data on something as basic as requests for adjustments and what was done. And, well, could you, would you answer that? Why is that if not I may, And if I may then be able to answer in a way that... Just add, please do answer my question if you wouldn't mind. To Thank the you. complexity and scale of our organisation and the number of areas that we're working on simultaneously. So if I think of our First Nations recruitment, we recruit more First Nations people than any other organisation. Yes, you I'm may be asking, frustrated. Miss, I'm not asking I'm, you about I'm First asking. Nations. If you be, Please, if you'd be good enough, you've answered the question. 
uh, as far as uh, I think you're able to do so. Thank you. Yes. All right. may, may I then address that specifically? Would we if like you're to answering, get If you're answering my, sorry, if you're answering my question, yes. If yes. you want to tell us about what you're doing in other areas, no. We are putting together an accessibility action plan that will help us improve in all these areas. My ask is that the Commission hears the genuine intent of Woolworths to create a truly inclusive culture across a number of areas. Do we need to make steps forward in all of them? Yes, we do, and we acknowledge that. But I'd, I'd ask for some um, um, appreciation of the complexity and scale of our organisation and the goodwill that does exist in many areas. Woolworths employers, you said, I think, in your statement, 200,000 people, more or less? Yes. What was the workforce pre-COVID-19? Approximately the same. Sorry, I'm not understanding the question. Are you sure Woolworths' uh, overall employment didn't increase materially during COVID-19? We've had both people who we've employed as well as people, areas where we've had to change our operations. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the actual question is. I I'd rather thought that Woolworths' uh, total employment had increased materially during COVID because Woolworths' operations had increased materially during COVID. I can get, the, if don't... that's a specific question, I can go get the exact numbers, but to my understanding, um, our numbers are not dramatically different. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr Gray, do you have targets for the recruitment of people with disability or the proportion of your workforce that has a disability? Uh, we have specific targets relating to those who are in a formal program, so the disability employment uh, services providers or program. We don't have targets at this stage in relation to the broader uh, population. What we have found, however, is with the introduction and part of the reason we uh, scoped our new HR system to ensure that we could have the ability for people to identify either in their application or uh, retrospectively, once they're an existing team member, uh, was to be able to track that sort of uh, data going forward. As I mentioned, I think there's a couple in my statement there about what we've seen uh, around the increase in, in people self-identifying. And if I could, you, you talked previously to the other panellists about those items and challenges. I think there are, three, there are three issues in my mind about how we get better data. Firstly, as the other panellists have talked about, in relation to sensitivities, it is that we're very cognizant it's a sensitive issue. We're certainly keen not to force anybody to disclose any matter that they don't feel comfortable to. However, we are strongly encouraging people to identify less about the disability, but what we can do as an organisation to help uh, make adjustments or to support them, uh, whatever their need may be to perform uh, their roles. That's, that's one issue. The second piece I think is the systems issue, which we have now addressed by having a system in place, an HR system that can collect that data. But I think thirdly, and perhaps a topic that hasn't been touched, is the culture in an organisation. Um, because I think people feel more willing to either apply to or remain employed or disclose or self-identify in an organisation which has a culture that is open, that is supportive, that is caring uh, in that regard. So I think there are three elements to improving this position. And, and that's, I think, key to, to our thinking as we move forward with our strategies and our plans. Can I just ask you about that? Um, we talked before about the number of people recorded in your HR system. Do you otherwise uh, have figures for people with disability that you have from other sources other than your HR sources? No, no we don't. What, what we do do, however, is uh, survey our teams in regards to their view around um, diversity and inclusion, whether they feel valued, uh, whether they believe people from any background can succeed in our organisation. And in fact, 83% of our people uh, say that they believe Kmart values diversity and inclusion. 88% of people I'm believe... To, I'm going to pause you there. Does that survey tell you about where people asked whether or not they have a disability on an anonymous basis? No, we are, we are, however, launching an inclusion survey as part of Harmony Week in yes. March next year, where we will be surveying people in an anonymous sense to yes. identify, amongst other things, whether they have a disability. Yes. And um, 
Yes, I, I have no further questions for these witnesses, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Galvalli, do you have any questions of uh, members of the panel? Yes, I'm just going, trying to find Jennifer Westacott. Um, her question, signalling that people with disabilities are welcome. That was a phrase she used as an overall goal for businesses. And the second, that takes me to the topic of disability as a strength. You know, that many people would say, well, you're more adventurous, you know, you're more flexible, there's all sorts of things. I just wondered if any of the three corporations um, have a comment on disability as a strength and whether that's expressed anywhere in any of the material that we value disability because we see it as a strength and whether that also might relate to disclosure, that people would be more likely to disclose. Perhaps I'm oh, sorry. Someone, go, you go first. Uh, Thank you. Someone go first. I'll go first. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I, will, I will choose. Ms Martin will go first. Very good. Oh, thank you. So, so thinking of only point, we um, set up what we call a diversity and inclusion advisory committee that's chaired by our managing director in Australia, and we co-opt co onto that large national group um, a lot of our senior managers and other operators across our business and sitting underneath it is a working group um, that we call on disability. So we're, we've got our platinum membership with the Australian Network on Disability, our diversity and inclusion strategy. We work on some key targets and we're trying to do a lot of work around inclusivity and really encouraging people to share their stories and information. I think um, when I did my statement, I might have provided some material on some examples of people that we've onboarded. What we found is that that whole arrangement and getting the word out and encouraging people to step forward and share their experiences um, really helps develop momentum in the organisation for other people to step forward and champion the, this, this whole piece. And um, from 10 years ago, when I first looked at our pay global system, three part-time workers identified as having a disability. Now we have 194 and increasing. And that's what we really want to get the word out, that everybody has a whole raft of different talents that helps us with reflecting the broader community, that talent pipeline. It's a great source of people to come into the business and it gives us stability and retention as well. So we put out all of those messages and I have to say that I've definitely seen a marked improvement and there's opportunity for us to further grow and develop and improve as well. Anyone else? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Gray can go next. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, I, I'd probably draw your uh, attention, Commissioner Galvelli, to uh, um, point number 10 of my supplementary uh, statement where we talk about, or I talk about the wording that we've now included in our application forms that says we encourage applications for people with disability um, and therefore we'd like to know if you need adjustments to be the de best team member you can be it came up and it goes on from there. Further, I draw your attention to the document that Council Assisting uh, discussed with you previously, which is uh, the People with Disability Recruitment Resource Pack. And in the first part of that introduction, we talk about, um, amongst other things, it is important that we are representative of our communities, but it's also important that we have diverse teams throughout Kmart. Diverse teams offer different points of view, experiences, talents and problem solving, which leads to, leads to innovative ideas and innovation. This coupled with great teamwork also leads to brilliant business outcomes. So it's, it's really important to us to signal that uh, to both applicants, but also our existing team members. Thank Ms. you. Belonsky. Thank you. Um, two areas that I just draw your attention to in our statement. Um, the one is about the specific capability of people with disability and seeing it actually as a strength. 
An example there was our relationship with Autocon, which is a consultancy that actually employs um, an employer of people on the autistic spectrum um, to use their specific capability um, in technology. And so we've now um, worked with them for a period of two years, really leveraging their ability to look at things differently and bring different skills to many of the systems that we have in stores. Um, and I've recently uh, recruited three of those people permanently. Um, so it's been a, a wonderful experience of um, the strength that a, a perceived disability can bring. Um, you know, I won't go through all our inclusion statements other than to echo what Mr. Gray has said about it is the culture as much as the specifics, um, which is what I think I've been trying to allude to around Woolworth's sort of focus on inclusion. But when you did mention the, the signaling a welcome, you know, there is a beautiful example in our Mulgrave site of um, an individual who um, is blind and actually operates our welcoming desk. And I think um, those symbols of visibility, not only in store, but throughout our organisation are things we're trying to do more of and celebrate. And there's certainly been feedback we've been given um, to do more highlighting those examples across the organisation. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ra. Um, could I ask a really practical question? Um, in the uh, previous uh, hearings that we had, we had a young bloke um, who's now a decent comedian. Um, he came to us and he told us his story and he worked in a grocery store for a period of time and one of the jobs he really wanted to do was to be a checkout operator. Let's imagine he applied to work at Woolworths or Kmart. Would he be able to work in a wheelchair behind a checkout? Would he be welcome? What adjustments would you make for him? Um, just how easy would it be for him to get a job in your average Woolworths or Kmart store um, and do the job given that he's in a wheelchair? You may choose which of the four questions you answer. <laughs> I'm happy to go first. If, if I was the hiring manager, the answer would be absolutely. And it's very easy to make those adjustments and our format and network development team would work with us to do that. Do I have confidence that every single hiring manager would respond in that way at the stage? I don't, and I hope that's where we'd get to over time. Do you know whether your stores would accommodate a wheelchair behind the checkout? Um, I would have to speak to the store manager specifically, but we've been inspired by Walgreens, for example, who say they um, employ 40% of their people have disability and, and we're um, committed through our accessibility action plan to, to create more and more opportunities for people with disability. I think that's a great example of one. Did Mr Gray want to say something? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, he, so firstly, more than welcome in our business, absolutely. Um, no doubt, I mean, as you may be aware, uh, Kmart has a lot of self-service checkouts, but for the checkouts that we do have that are uh, manned by um, our team members, we would need to make an adjustment, but we'd be more than happy to make those adjustments uh, in that regard. Mr Gray, can I take you back to the uh, recruitment resource book that we spoke of earlier? And I've noticed on page nine... There's a information to recruiters to take notice of occupational health and safety laws, and including in that it says, accordingly, Kmart needs to determine if a candidate has the capacity or ability to perform the inherent requirements of the role with or without reasonable workplace adjustments and whether they can do this safely without risk of harm to themselves or others. What assistance is given to your recruiters to interpret that in a way that it does not frighten them off, because one of the things that apparently have been said by, by uh, surveys is that one of the key fears people have of employing people with disability is that they might be a workplace safety risk. In your recruitment brochure that instructs people, it actually names it. How do you make sure that that does not frighten people? I guess I would say a couple of things. One is that the vast majority of adjustments that people request or that are required, whether they be safety, supervision or otherwise, are accommodated. The second piece is we also talk right up front in our recruitment application form that we encourage people with disability to apply and we're open to and would like to understand what adjustments they may well need. 
to enable them to do their job. So rather than creating it as a barrier, we're saying, what can we do to help support you do that job, whether it's safely or otherwise? So that's the but way. I would agree that's not what that says. What it's always that's, doing that's, is warning that's not the what person. That says. That's correct. That's not what that says. But what I'm saying is in terms of how do, how do we, this document here is not something that goes to applicants or to, to scare recruiters off because our recruiters are trained in the disability employment uh, side of things and making sure that we're inclusive. So they don't look at that and say, well, if there is a safety issue, we can't deal with it. What they say is, how do I get, get support to make an adjustment for this person to ensure that we can include them in our workforce? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, presumably, in the case of uh, Kmart Woolworths, a significant proportion of your customers are people with disability. What do you do to accommodate them? Perhaps I could, I could start uh, with that. There, there's a couple of things, Commissioner, that I'd, I'd like to highlight to you. Firstly, we've launched a range of products in our stores that represent people with disability, whether it be vision impairment, mobility, um, so toys for children to make it and help us normalise uh, disability or ability uh, that is different to others in the community. So that's one piece. We've also included uh, people with disability in our advertising, be that TV advertising or catalogue uh, advertising. Thirdly, we've introduced the concept called Quiet Space into 27 stores, which we started as a pilot. Um, and Quiet Space runs for two hours on every Wednesday afternoon. In those stores, we've adjusted the lighting to space it. We've dulled the lighting and we also reduce noise and distractions in the store. So, for example, we stop music playing. The purpose behind that is to enable people with, or who may be on the spectrum or have children who may be on the spectrum who get um, impacted by noise and distraction to be able to come and shop uh, in a way that doesn't uh, create large anxiety or difficulties for them. We're also seeing benefits of that, obviously, for our team members uh, in, this, in those stores as well. Um, so there's some of the things uh, that we've been doing to try and impact that. I would also say, from a customer perspective, um, the reaction to um, our stores and to our team members, particularly those who may have a disability, is extremely positive. And our, our uh, feedback from both customers and team members uh, and our experience with employing people with disability, you know, I can only say it's positive. So we look forward to doing more in this regard. Thank you for the additional editorial. Yes, Ms. Uh, Polonsky, what's, uh, what's your experience? Quickly, what we would do is um, we've tried to build in systemically a way of looking at how our stores can be built and designed um, with inclusion in mind and with accessibility in mind. And so our format and network development team um, go through training around that. Sorry. No, that's all right. I just received a signal. Nothing to do with you. Carry on. Um, and our group design team also go through training so that we're building in accessibility through the design of our stores, um, which, which helps um, in terms of space, width, lifts, ramps, um, and a number of issues as well, in addition to those. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I assume that uh, there are no uh, legal representatives who wish to ask any members of the panel any questions. And unless I hear to the contrary, I'll assume that none does want to ask any questions. In that case, thank you very much to uh, each Chair, of the... So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'd just like to, before... I, if the Commission was about to rise, I was just going to ask to tender the statements now. Well, I'm just going to thank I'm the sorry. members of the panel and then by all means... Thank you. you sorry. Can ...tender whatever you like. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much to each of the members of the panel, Mr. Gray, Ms. Martin, Ms. Polonsky. Thank you for your assistance and thank you for the statements that you have provided and for the evidence you've given today. Thank you. Yes. Um, Chair, I'd, I'd now like to tender the statements of the witnesses that you just heard from. If I could do that in the same um, compendious way that I have in the past. First, I have the statement of Mr. Gray of 18 June 2021 and attachments. And we'd ask that that be marked, the statement be marked 19-9 and the attachments be marked 19-9.1 to 19-9.12. That the supplementary statement of Mr Gray dated 29 October be tendered as Exhibit 19-9.13 with attachments 19.9.14 and 15. The statement of Ms Polunsky 
uh, be tendered as 19-10 and the attachments 19-10 to 5. And finally, the statement of Ms Martin of 15 June 2021 be tendered as Exhibit 19-11 with the attachments 19-11.1 to 19-11.16. Uh, I'm sorry, 11.6. Yes, all of the documents uh, uh, to which Ms Bennett have refer has referred will be admitted into evidence and given the exhibit numbers she has identified and I've initialed the document that records uh, Thank you, that Chair. Material. Can I note that the tender of the Woolworths document might, uh, will, is subject to the provision of the corrections foreshadowed at the start yes. of the evidence, which we expect and understand be provided in writing this afternoon. Yes, thank you. Please, that can be done. All right, it's now uh, just after 10 to 3. Uh, shall we resume? Are we going to adjourn now? Yes, if possible, could we have 15 minutes? Yes, well, then we'll resume at uh, uh, 5 past 3. Please, Chair. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, next, the next panel consists of another three employers. We have Ms. Lewis from IBM, Ms. Badenoch from Telstra, and Mr. Nelson from Services Australia. I wonder if they might be um, brought into the virtual hearing room. Yes, I think we now have members of the panel on uh, screen. So thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence, uh, Ms. Lewis, uh, Ms. Batnock and Mr. Nelson. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and the statements that have been prepared for the Royal Commission. Uh, just to let you know where everybody is located, Commissioner Galbally is in Melbourne. Uh, Commissioner Ryan is with me in the Sydney hearing room and Ms Bennett, who will be asking you some questions, uh, is also in the Sydney hearing room and I'll now ask Ms Bennett to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to start by asking you each to identify your statements that you've made. Can I start with you, Ms Lewis? You've made a supplementary statement which the commissioners will find behind tab 31 of Tender Bundle B. That's, that's termed a supplementary statement. And by that statement, you incorporate and adopt the statement of Ms LePage, is that right? Yes, correct. And that, that primary statement, if I can call it that, is at tab 15 of Tender Bundle B, commissioners. Um, Ms Lewis, speaking about both statements read together, are they accurate? Yeah. Yes, they are. Thank you. Um, Mr Nelson, turning to you, you've made a statement which the commissioners will find at Tender Bundle C, tab 35. Is that statement accurate, Mr Nelson? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Badenoch, am I, first, am I saying your name correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've made a statement and a supplementary statement to this Royal Commission. The commissioners will find the primary statement at tab 91 and the supplementary at tab 117. Ms Badenoch, read together, are those statements correct? Yes, they are. Thank you. Um, commissioners, this, this panel is concerned with a developing area which has arisen out of the statements provided by the various employers to the Royal Commission for this hearing. Some organisations, in addressing barriers to people's disability accessing employment, have identified as part of the steps that they have taken that they have initiated proactive recruitment of neurodiverse individuals focused upon areas of their strengths or perceived strengths. And it's that issue that I'd like to explore to understand um, how such a process came into being in each organisation, how it's operating and how it differs from what I will refer to as mainstream recruitment and I'd like to ask about how that impacts on the overall inclusion of people with disability within the workplace. So um, starting with you, Ms Lewis, um, just as a, a, a starting point, is it leaving aside the neurodiversity program that we're here to talk about, is it IBM's ambition to have more people with a disability working in its organisation or working for it? Yes, absolutely. 
and that's not contingent upon this neurodiversity stream. That's a, a broader ambition. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And Ms. Badenock, is it the same for Telstra? Absolutely. We are keen to make sure that we access the full talent pool and as part of that, that includes employing people with a disability. Yes. And Mr Nelson, you'd agree with that proposition generally, leaving aside neurodiversity recruitment. Services Australia seeks to increase its representation of employees with a disability. Is that right? Yes, it does. Right. I just want to very briefly understand what I've called the mainstream recruitment process. I, I'd like to be able to compare and contrast it with how you operate in your neurodiversity programs. So I'm going to just start very briefly with the application and I'm going to ask you to sketch it in the briefest terms, in, including how a person makes their application, progresses to an interview and an offer. So those three issues. So um, Ms Badenock, starting with you, can you tell the commissioners very briefly what your mainstream recruitment process looks like? Absolutely. So generally speaking, almost 100%, just shy of 100% of our roles would be what we would term publicly advertised. So not through a, a recruitment agency, but via public platforms such as Seek or another equivalent platform so that our roles are visible to much of the market as, as possible. And that's quite a deliberate choice that, that we make because we think that that uh, is our best chance at attracting or at least making the full talent pool aware of our employment opportunities. An employ a, a prospective employee can then seek to apply for a role if uh, they, they need assistance, they are able to flag right at the start of the process that they may need some modification or additional support with that recruitment process so that we can put relevant modifications to the process in place. Um, and that may be from everything from their people's ability to deal with our standard application process, so whether they need assistance uh, and a recruiter to engage with them in a more bespoke process or uh, whether it might be wanting to flag with us should they come through to interview that they will need some assistance, for example. I'm um, sorry to interrupt. Can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms Badnock. I'm just going to ask you for the... And I understand I've just finished examining a range of witnesses about precisely this process. And so I understand that you're keen to tell the Royal Commission about it. Uh, and I, I am interested, but at this point, I really just want to understand the undifferentiated process. So assume a, a, um, a person okay. without, uh, in, a, in very short form so that we can then identify variations Absolutely. So we would advertise a role through a public forum. Applicants would apply generally online uh, for, for that role. Uh, the process, depending on the role type, uh, would either through a recruiter's hands or sometimes through some uh, artificial intelligence shortlist uh, applicants to go for, for first round interview. Uh, and we go through a first round and then, depending on the nature of the role, multiple rounds of interview to finally select uh, a candidate based on the requirements specified of the role. Thank you. And just to ask uh, very briefly about the interview, is that a face-to-face -face interview with a recruitment specialist and someone in the business? It will vary. Uh, yeah. it, it may be that the first round sometimes is done purely by recruiters um, and they will start to shortlist down it, depending on the number of applicants or the nature and complexity of the role. Uh, it may be with someone in the business at, at the same time. So it will vary depending on the role. Right, and they are what we would in pre-COVID times have called face-to-face -face interviews, however they Not might now be. <laughs> yeah, they would have. They would have always had a, a variance between online to physical face to face. So we always have had a, a degree of virtual uh, interviewing as well. Okay, thank you. Um, turning to you, Ms. Lewis, can you, in short form, tell us about your process with the same processes: application, screening, interview, offer. Yes, certainly. Very similar. So we will um, post 
roles on um, public forums and that, as well as our own website. Um, people will apply for those opportunities and that. It comes through to the recruitment organisation. Um, we would do a, a screen at the recruitment stage. And of course, um, we would then notify um, if we would like to go through first round um, screening interview. If anyone needs any accommodation at that stage, uh, we would actually ask if they required any assistance. Um, and then further on through the interview stages, it would move to second round. And depending on how senior that role is, it could even move to third round. Most of the interviewing process is done virtually and or face-to-face, -face, but we do have that option. And that was not just about COVID during the period, but also prior to COVID, we have that opportunity for people to go both mediums. Um, now, Ms Lewis, I'm going to ask you to slow down slightly and I'll take the opportunity to remind both myself and the rest of the panel to do the same. Thank you. Uh, your um, interviews, are they behavioural conversational interviews? That you've they just are behavioural-based interviewing. Yes, thank you. Uh, and that I take it is the same for you, Ms Badenock at Telstra? Correct. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Nelson, can you briefly sketch the process in your mainstream recruitment? Yes, Sorry? I will. And, and uh, noting, of course, there are opportunities for people to indicate if they have disability through the process and be supported. The general process is that we would advertise a position to the entire Australian community uh, we're required to do that. We do that through what's called APS jobs and other portals or other for, uh, formats. People would apply online for those positions and then uh, through an application process. So they would lodge an application with their um, CV to us. We would consider those generally uh, and then invite them to undertake an assessment process. Now, in more recent times, we've moved away, as uh, many people have, away from face-to-face -face meetings as the primary source. In fact, we've undertaken a number of bulk recruitment processes recently where we have had an assessment process which is online, which requires people to show a particular aptitude um, for uh, different things, and then they would progress uh, to a one-way video interview before they are assessed by a group of uh, managers uh, and then progress further for... Um, uh, it's good for being uh, considered to be successful and not in the process. Uh, we would also, of course, contact referees where required. And a one-way video interview is a person answering questions to a video and then submitting the recording. That's correct. I see. Okay, now, um, all three of you have, all three of the organisations which you represent uh, have in your diversity uh, program uh, can you tell me, for, and that involves some changes in the way that you recruit and then retain people. Is that a fair summary across the board? I'm just going to ask you to nod if that's a fair summary. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to ask now, why did you develop the neurodiversity program? And I'd start with you, Mr Nelson. Yes. Where did the idea come from? Let me start there. Uh, our... Um I suppose historically our interest in this started in the Chief Information Officer area in IT. So we engaged with uh, an organisation to establish and be a part of what's called the Dandelion Program. Now that's a, a contracted arrangement, so it differs from our current process that we're working through now um, and which um, differs in the, the extent that people who came through the Dandelion Program are contractors People who are coming through what we now have as the Aurora program uh, are employees of ours. So quite different um, in, in relation to areas of focus as well. Um, the initial interest came from a body of research that was understood and well shared at the time in 2014, 2015 about the attributes of people, uh, neurodiverse people and how they are being successfully applied around the world in different areas. Uh, into the IT space, particularly around testing. So that's where the genesis of this came from. And I'm sorry, um, testing what? Uh, IT testing, user testing, yes. if you like. Yes. Um, in more recent times, uh, we have considered there's a broader application to people with neurodiverse skills, and again, based on research 
um, we undertook the first of our pilot programs in 2020, whereby we engaged uh, 11 people through um, with assistance through through um, specialist Stern, who are specialists in the neurodiverse space. Um, they supported us with that process over the last 12 months. Um, the process will run up until about 18 months, and we've committed to another 30 people through this Aurora program with specialist to Stern as well going forward. Um, the thing that we're doing differently to what we've done in the past is broadening out the range of areas in the business that they are working in, those people. Can I, so, can I, pause, you, can I pause there because I... I want to come to that. I just want to um, speak to your colleagues first about the same topic about where the neurodiversity program came from, what its genesis was. Can I ask you, Ms. Lewis, in your organisation, IBM, can you speak to the genesis of the neurodiversity recruitment program? Yeah, so the neurodiversity program is a global program for IBM over nine countries and Australia being one of those um, countries that have adopted the neurodiversity program. And it really came from the recruitment process, how it provided the opportunity for people to showcase their skills rather than describe them, which is through normally um, the way we would do recruitment process mainstream. And so that allowed people with neurodiversity um, abilities to be able to really shine through this type of a workshop approach through a hiring process. Thank you. That's, yes. that's very helpful. Ms. Badenock, can I ask you the same question? Are you aware of the genesis of Telstra's neurodiversity program? Absolutely. So it's really part of a broader commitment that we have to diversity and inclusion. So it sits within that space for, for us. Uh, and we have a number of programs which look to broaden the scope of candidates that we attract uh, for a range of reasons. One, um, we absolutely believe that there's a there's just talent in uh, in all communities uh, we, which we want to be able to to access also we have specific roles for example that we do want to employ people who have different experiences for example people who will actually test our products and services to ensure uh, that they are able to serve service all of our, our customers so we want people with lived experiences to come and work for us and to actually help our product development our program delivery and our customer service and support. So that is where it came from. Um, do you want me to stop there or do you want me to talk about no, that, the program? Itself? No, I'll, I'll come to the program in a moment. I'm just interested in that genesis and, and building on that. Mr Nelson, can you tell me about the involvement of neurodiverse people in the development of the program with Services Australia? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, uh, Council, that um, we're actually engaged with specialists to Stern, who are experts in the uh, development of uh, neurodiverse programs. So we don't uh, indicate or suggest that we are experts in any way. So using their uh, knowledge and expertise, we've been able to form a, um, a recruitment or selection process which accommodates and allows us to understand the skills and strengths of neurodiverse people so that we can identify those people who are going to be most successful in our work areas in the workplace. Thank you. Ms Badenock, um, I, I suspect you're going to tell me the same thing, but perhaps you can tell the Royal Commission about the involvement of neurodiverse people in the development of your program. Absolutely. Uh, so we have actually followed exactly the same path, which is partnering with specialist CERN, uh, leveraging someone with specialist capability in this area because we didn't feel that that was something that, that we necessarily brought to the table. So they have helped us define our advertising, our recruitment, our onboarding, the entire process all the way through, uh, just as, as Mr Nelson described. Yes, thank you. Ms. Ms. Um... Lewis, can you tell me about, from IBM's perspective, about the involvement of neurodiverse people? Yes, and um, the same too. We have engaged with Specialist Stern um, in this area and that, but also we've um, included our business resourcing group, which is our neurodiversity business resource group, which has over 2,000 members um, that are neurodivergent mm -hmm. but also allies. 
and um, we actively engage that community in regards to building a successful program, um, you know, that's sustainable, but also, you know, applies to neurodiversity recruitment, but also the success in regards to career development and ongoing development of our people. Well, Ms Lewis, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'd like to ask about career development. Can you tell the Royal Commission about what the development path is for people who are recruited through this program? Yeah, so a lot of them come into the areas um, of development, um, cloud computing, um, testing, um, and they've actually, out of the people that we've already hired through this program, we've already had in the first two years, six of them um, move up in regards to their career development. Um, so that is an upward movement, which is fabulous to see that they have moved not only from client sets, but also from for some, you know, different roles in that. So um, it is good to see that we're seeing some career development also in this area. Um, but we are focused on the training and development of our people. So um, in that area, we have um, available all of the online tools and resources for training and development. Um, and our neurodiverse community is highly engaged in this area in regards to upskilling their ability in not only the areas that they're focused on today, but of the future and our leaders are really encouraging that to make sure that they're looking at what are the possibilities for their next role what are they looking for in their career path and so our leaders are really helping guide them through about where they can focus on that skill development as well as to make sure we're pairing them with mentoring um, and also those coaching coaches that we have available in IBM. Um, and, of course, our community of our business resource group are extremely helpful in regards to making sure that they're a collective group and that they're encouraging one another as well um, to do their best but also to excel um, in okay. IBM. Is it, is it fair to say that somebody through your neurodiversity program might well be identified and recruited as um, a specialist like a programmer but they don't, your experience so far, two years into the program, is they don't necessarily stay in that role. They can move into testing. They can move into other areas um, that really is suited to their skill set. Um, there is no barriers for them to move into any open roles that become available um, if they've got the right, you know, required skill set for that role. And Ms Badenov, how long has your neurodiversity program been on foot? We're, we're fairly early into this journey. So we had our first intake in January 2021. So it, it now being November, um, it might be too soon to answer this question, but um, is it your intention that people recruited into that, that role remain in specialist roles or do they have the opportunity to move around the organisation? They absolutely have had the opportunity to, to move around the organisation. There are some uh, standard supports that, that we have. So we have a huge amount of available training, development and career pathway supports that sit for our entire workforce. But also uh, for this particular cohort, we have done a range of things from uh, specialist training for their managers to ensure that they are actually more, more equipped to have the right career conversations and think about how they might need some additional support in exploring different roles and different opportunities uh, in, in the organisation. We also, uh, like IBM, have what we call an employee representative group, which uh, we have a group called Telstra Ability, uh, who creates a cohort of people who either have disabilities or uh, a range of allies who are there to coach, mentor and support people through their development journey. So absolutely, we would expect, expect people to learn, grow and develop and have no, no less opportunity than anyone else uh, at Telstra. Uh, Mr Nelson, how long has your, I believe, pilot program been on foot? Um, so the beginning of 2020 was when we started that program. So it's um, probably a little bit over 12 months old now, um, coming up to probably closer to 18 months. And how many people have you recruited in through that program so far? Uh, 11, and we have um, have had approval for another 30, and we're engaging heavily with specialists now. I see. And we, we've, we've skipped over into the actual 
uh, cohort of people who are now employed by you. But I'd like to focus on the way in which you change your recruitment strategy for this program. And Mr Nelson, can you speak first to that? What have you changed about the way that you recruit people um, as part of this neurodiversity program? I think this is a part of a broader strategy um, that's come through our diversity um, strategy and also our inclusive action plan. So um, all of the actions that we take are aligned to that. This is a really a, a quite a specific program, though. So it's, I suppose what we do get is the learnings from this process and from working with not only our neurodiverse people but also specialists to Stern, and then we get to apply that to our other processes. We're also doing a, a broader piece of work with specialists to Stern to um, try and see how we can reduce the barriers to uh, recruitment or engagement, if you like, uh, because some of the feedback in our conversations with them was that, and with our neurodiverse people, was that um, there are difficulties in terms of the normal processes for people to uh, make it through that, uh, through our normal recruitment process to engagement with uh, organisations. So can I just pause there and ask, what is it that needed to change about your, your standard recruitment process in order to facilitate neurodiverse people coming into your organisation? Well, the can, you, feedback, can you think of any specifics for us? Um, some of the feedback went to the structure of the approaches that we, we took and the fact that we weren't um, possibly confirming what to expect well enough for people before they would arrive for their interviews and undertake those interviews. Um, our experience from that has been that we need to give people a, a good forewarning as to what to expect through these processes because uncertainty is something that um, neurodiverse people uh, find difficulty with. All right. Ms Lewis, are you able to identify what the key changes are that IBM needed to implement to, um, in, to create for further opportunities for the neurodiverse community here? Yes, yeah, so as I um, mentioned before about the showcasing um, yes. is really important. And so, um, and I'm going to go a little bit tactical here. So we've got a four-week program um, and the week one is the overview for uh, neurodiverse candidates in regards to the roles that are available in IBM, um, the career paths that are available in IBM. And then we move into week two, which is um, a mock client type of a technique um, that they get to design their own website. And then we go into week three, which is a presentation, design thinking, um, you know, group exercise and that. And then the week four is shadowing an ibm -er in regards to what we call a day in the life um, of IBM. So they can understand um, what they would experience you know, in a day in a life by BMR. We also then provide them with a pack in readiness of being um, and joining IBM. And we also give a pack to managers in regards to, you know, how do you, um, you know, welcome, you know, your neurodiverse um, uh, new well, employee yes. into um, IBM. Is that that four week program, is that before the person is hired or after they're hired? So that is um, that process is actually through the assessment phase. So that is um, we will do the assessment phase, and then we'll go through in regards to moving those people that um, are successful into appointment of those roles. Okay. And so, how do people get into the assessment phase? So they lodge an application online. How does that uh, happen? So specialist Stern. Again, we go through Specialist Stern um, as our recruitment um, partner and they will actually um, go through um, all of the applications and that and then put those people um, that, you know, should go through the assessment phase um, in regards to the recruitment assessment phase through that four-week period. So it's a completely different recruitment process. Very different. There's no more of the um, interview. No. There's even the application form is done away with. It, it, no behavioural interview. Yep, it is. It's absolutely. It's it's a relaxed atmosphere. It's a cohort. You know, they're going through in regards to really showcasing what they're great at, um, and this period of time allows them to do that, and for they allow them to get comfortable. You know, with you know the IBMers that they're they're meeting for the first time, and it gives them the best opportunity to do their and, utmost and best. And Ms. Badnock, can you? 
tell us about how you, how IBM, sorry, how Telstra uh, changes its recruitment process from the one that you described earlier um, to what is used in the neurodiversity recruitment space. So very much like IBM, it is a completely different process. Um, we, we have we've chosen to work with specialist donors as well, and specialists and do the direct sourcing. Mm-hmm of the cohort so they don't come through our general advertising i mean we may end up with with neurodiverse candidates through our normal process but for this program in particular uh the cohort is sourced uh and brought to the roles via specialist turn it the actual recruitment process is non-traditional non-interview based uh, assessment. So it, it is, uh, as in the case of IBM, where we enable people to actually demonstrate their capabilities through structured activities and interactions. So much more sort of role-based, actually, you know, showing what they would do on the job with the managers as part of that that process. So completely outside of our normal process in this case. So if I understand correctly, um, each of the three organisations on the panel today identify roles or areas which in partnership with Specialist Earn they have identified as being appropriate for neurodiverse candidates or appropriately um, suited perhaps to neurodiverse candidates and you partner with Specialist Earn to identify candidates and then in the case of IBM and Telstra there's a multi-week process. I'll come to you in a moment, Mr Nelson. There's a multi-week process where the the application process really takes place through that showcase process. Is that a, a fair summary, at least for Telstra and IBM? Yeah. And Mr. Nelson, I think you want to yes. you want to update your answer about the way in which you uh, cha- you've changed your recruitment process. Can you? Uh, uh, yes, I do. So I possibly under, uh, misunderstood your question. I yes. apologise. Um, so it's almost a mirror of Telstra and IBM process in terms of partnering with the specialist to CERN. Thank you. Now, can I ask, is this yes. done virtually and is it done one on one? That's, I didn't quite catch that. And so I'll ask um, Ms. Lewis first is it one on one or is it virtual? Um, at the current stage, it is virtual, given and the that's current of COVID. Stage. Yes, correct. Uh, Ms. Badnock? Likewise, it would normally be a face to face process, but it has been uh, needed to be virtual given current circumstances. And is that the same for you, Mr Nelson? Uh, originally it was face-to-face, but it will be virtual. And, and, and it's one recruiter to a candidate, is that right? Uh, there are workshop activities as well that uh, involve a number of people, so we can identify how people collaborate and how they work as a part of a team also. So it's not all uh, singular or individual. I see a lot of nodding. Is that yes. a fair description, Ms Badenock and Ms Lewis? Correct, yes. yes. Thank you. Correct. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Just Mishnah. wanted to straighten that out. Do yes. the uh, candidates get paid while this is going on? Yes, correct. Oh, wow. Telstra? Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to confirm. Uh, I'll have to come back to you on that, that question. I don't believe they do get paid during the assessment process, no. Yes. And, um, Mr Nelson, can you tell us whether the candidates are paid during the process? I don't believe they do. Is yours a four... Is, Service Australia, a four-week process as well? Yes. Okay. Um, and these are, these schemes are for recruitment into specific roles, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, correct. And I, I want to just distinguish that from it, it's not available to somebody, sorry, let me go back. If you have a, a role in HR and somebody contacts you and says, and I'll direct this first to you, Ms Badenoff, um, uh, I am neurodiverse and I would like to showcase my abilities to you in the way that you do in um, your neurodiversity recruitment stream, but for a HR role, is that available? Yes, we certainly can effectively do that. The The biggest difference for the neurodiverse um, recruitment, which is a very targeted recruitment, where we're only opening those jobs to neurodiverse candidates. So, in, in fact, we're not opening it to broader applicants and the pool is uh, sourced by specialists. Where we advertise a job 
and someone puts their hands up and says, I'm a neurodiverse candidate, I want to join your HR function, we will then talk to them about the process they need to help them apply for that job. So we will we will do a whole range of different things, whether it's moving away from traditional interview. Uh, if if we need to, and we have examples of that in our general recruitment as well. But the difference is they're then in a general candidate pool. While we might accommodate their needs differently, they're in amongst a whole range of candidates, whereas with the neurodiverse program, it is a specifically a neurodiverse cohort being applied to a specific number of roles. And so, Ms. Lewis, I think your program has, or IBM's program, has been running the longest of the three on the panel today. Um, have you identified some changes that can be scaled across your general recruitment to accommodate neurodiverse individuals more broadly? Yes, I, th I think what we've discovered is that we need to, um, at the forefront, identify those that are neurodiverse in that so we can tailor the mainstream interviewing process um, to make sure that they accommodate, similar to what um, Alex from Telstra had mentioned, so we can accommodate that. Now, we do have an accommodation process that if they're identified, um, if they want to identify that they need accommodation, we would, for example, in some of our roles, if we are to do an assessment we would actually consider if they had put in an accommodation and that, we either would potentially miss the assessment for those people, skip that, or allow them a longer period of time to respond to that assessment. And so we've done some adjustments like that as we've been going through this program and process um, of adjusting even our mainstream to be more adaptable to make sure that, you know, all candidates can come through not only mainstreams but also our pathway programs. Um, and Mr Nelson, can you tell the Commission if you have observed any um, any cultural change in your organisation from the implementation of, of this program, excepting it's a, at, at an early stage? Um, I think we can, and the feedback from those managers and those sort of divisions or areas within the business, you can you can actually see a change in the organisation. I think that comes through in their, their broader... Uh, employee survey slash census results that we see. Um, I think there's also a, a broadening acceptance of neurodiverse people across the organisation because we're talking more about neurodiversity, which is great. Um, we also have channels and, and options for people to join us through using our recruitability program that's available in the APS and also through our affirmative measures uh, processes which are uh, only available to people with disability, which um, we are starting to use more often, which gives greater opportunity for people to be engaged. So um, I can hear from the evidence that the three panellists are giving that this is considered to have been a really positive program. Is that is that fair, Ms Badenoch? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's been positive both in terms of the quality and skills that we're able to bring into the organisation, but I think also to what you just alluded to, it's another step in learning as an organisation where we can adjust our processes and enhance our processes to um, make, make our organisation more accessible to all candidates. And I saw the others um, nodding vigorously, and so I'll accept that uh, as an answer that applies equally to Ms Lewis and Mr Nelson. I'd like to ask about something that has been troubling me about the program, uh, and I'm not sure if it's been considered by your organisations or indeed if it's even an issue. It's this. Can I perhaps illustrate it by reference to a document? It, it comes from uh, Ms Badenoch's your statement, uh, and it is at tab... Um, a tab of the bundle. It's uh, document TEL.0001. It's on the screen now, 0001.0028 underscore 0004. Now, this document I understand to be uh, an explainer about um, what the program is. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. It's a PowerPoint deck to explain to people what the program is and the neurodiverse recruitment program. I just want to read a couple of points from this page six. 
The first star on the left, I'll read it slowly. Um, it could be um, enhanced so you could see it. Um, I'll, I'll read it out, Chair. <laughs> it says, many people with neurological conditions such as autism spectrum disorder, dyspraxia and dyslexia have extraordinary skills, including in pattern recognition, memory and mathematics, but the neurodiverse population remains largely untapped, in particular autistic people. I just want to read another example from the same page. It says on the opposite page, on the facing page, autistic teams undertaking software testing roles in an Australian federal government department demonstrated 30% higher productivity. So I just wanted to pause. And there are examples of this throughout the materials of, I think, all of the organisations who provided evidence and who run programs of this kind. Is there a con Do you have a concern that the establishment of a neurodiverse recruitment program has the potential to send a message that the recruitment of people with disability is valued only when there is a measurable increase in output? It's a, I think that's a, a fair and relevant question to, to raise. I don't think so. If you, if you look at our broader positioning of diversity and inclusion, uh, at Telstra and employing people with a disability. It is not all positioned around productivity. It's positioned around a whole range of things. One, we actually do genuinely believe that to tap into the talent pool means tapping into the whole talent pool, not just part of it. We believe that our employee base should represent the communities in which we operate. We sell products and services to the full community. So to do that effectively, to develop the right products and services, we actually need to understand the needs of all of our, our customers. Um, and we actually genuinely have a commitment to accessibility. So actually understanding how, whether it's our products and services, whether it's information we put on a website or develop as an online tool, um, that we understand how that needs to be built to support the full inclusion of the communities uh, that we serve. To do that well, we actually believe we need a very diverse workforce. So it, that's not productivity in its pure sort of productivity sense. Is it making us a better business that better understands its customers and better serves its business, its, its customers? Absolutely. Uh, it, it is having the right mix of workforce is about being a better organisation, but not just from a productivity sense, equally from a cultural one, equally from a customer service one. Can I ask you a question just related to the same part? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Ryan. It might be you were going to ask it anyway, but a lot of the jobs that you've got listed there that people with neurodiversity could do, they could be largely summarised as IT-related. Are you at all worried that to some extent we could be stereotyping people with neurodiversity to that their best use is behind the screen, um, you know, back at the back end of the office, you know, working on the computer? Yeah, so there's there's sort of two two answers to that, I think. One, uh, in working with an organisation like Specialist Stern, they've absolutely guided to certain roles uh, being actually easier to place and more successful to place uh, neurodiverse candidates into. We equally advertise all of our roles. And as I mentioned before, we actually get a broad base of candidates with a range of disabilities, including, including neurodiverse candidates into other roles. So we are talking purely about this very narrow program. And I think one of the things that is critical when you lift up beyond this one program is to look at what organisations are doing to attract uh, employees with a disability to their broader candidate pool. If you only ran programs that have channeled to specific jobs with specific candidate pools, I think long-term you would run that risk, absolutely. But I think what this is doing is enabling us to augment and learn about how we run better recruitment processes. Over time, we should be translating that to how we recruit on our broad base not running specialised separate programs because I think that will actually open up candidates to all of our jobs. But equally, part of these programs are training our managers to be more effective at supporting people with a range of disabilities, including neurodiverse candidates, into jobs. So this is, for me, a transition point as opposed to an end state because if you did it as an end state, yes, I think you would be running that risk. And so a transition point to a situation where 
um, the kinds of adjustments that you make as part of the neurodiversity recruitment are more readily available across the board at Telstra. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And more conscious. So they're available today. If someone actually identifies as needing those supports, you can get them today. But I think one, it actually has us augment our broader recruitment process to be move away from some of the more traditional pure interview base, because not everyone self identifies for, for one. And two, I think we need to build the confidence that people feel that it is a culture that is inclusive and shows its willingness, its commitment to actually employing a broad, diverse base of employees. Ms. Lewis. Sorry, can, uh, oh, oh, sorry Ms. Badnock, if for someone is recruited under the Neurodiverse Recruitment Programme, where do they work? Do they work with uh, people who are not necessarily neurodiverse or is there a separate section? How does it work? No, they go into all parts uh, of our, our business. So it's really just that there are certain roles that have been tagged to, to actually bring those candidates into. Uh, they go into our broad-based employee population working in teams, but the, the difference is that they have a supported process in entering into the organisation um, so making sure that they have more successful entry and that their line managers are trained to actually have some additional understanding of their unique needs and, and support to make them successful. Other than that, they're very much in, in the broad-based population of our workforce. Do their co-workers uh, normally know that they have been recruited through the Neurodiverse Recruitment Programme? Where it is specifically through the Neurodiverse Programme, they would would most likely know, yes. Uh, we would have neurodiverse candidates enter not, not through this program where that would not necessarily be known unless someone chose for it to be known. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Ms Lewis, I, I'm conscious of the time, but I, I'm just interested if IBM perceives a risk of stereotype or silo, and I, I'm not suggesting it's happening or happened. I'm wondering if it's a risk that's been identified and mitigated or not. Uh, you know, the thing with the neurodiversity, it's interesting because we have found most neurodivergent uh, candidates have come through mainstream recruitment processes. Um, and so that's, you know, that is fabulous to see, right? So in regards to, I suppose, exactly how Alex explained it from um, Telstra, um, you know, they could be hired into any role that they are suited for. We look at the ability of an individual, not the disability we're looking for people that can, you know, showcase their ability and skill set in that. And so even though the neurodiversity program, and I know that what that's what we're focused on here, and that does focus on cloud engineers and cybersecurity and testing and software engineers and that, they are specific roles. But um, as we go through specialist earn, that is what we're looking for for that particular time. And so that's what we're hiring for in that neurodiversity program. But we have P-Tech available, we have, of course, mainstream and other ways, even graduate programs, where we have neurodiverse candidates coming through those programs as well into open roles. So it's fair to say you, you don't see it as a risk in the context of your overall organisation or you think you've got structures in place to manage that risk? We've got structures in place in that, and especially with the, the rollout of the extensive training that we have available for not only employees but for, um, for managers um, and to make sure that everyone is self-aware and that we're aware about, you know, diversity and inclusion and that. Um, and so I think with all of our training modules as well, uh, as well as our business resource groups and our active engagement in the community, I think is really important to just really help drive that awareness across IBM as an organisation. Mr Nelson, do you agree that is, is there a risk of stereotype and siloing people who come through this program? Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think it may well have been a risk, a risk in the past. Um, I think it's less of a risk now because there is a growing understanding and acceptance of the role of people uh, from neuro, neuro, neurodivergent people, if you like, um, and what they can bring to an organisation. We're also rolling out significant numbers of um, learning modules and other supports for managers to try and reduce any um, inability for them to manage or actually just build their confidence and capability to manage people across the organisation, regardless 
of uh, whether they're neurodiverse or have other disability or come from a cultural background which is different or other. So we're, we're becoming smarter at uh, building the capability of our managers, I think, and being more accepting. Thank you. Chair, I, I have no further questions for these witnesses. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll just ask the commi other commissioners if they have any questions. First, Commissioner Gelbilly. Um, Thank you for, you for your presentations. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. I asked mine on the way through, so no. Thank you. Um, with the neurodiverse recruitment program, um, the autism spectrum is a very broad spectrum. It can range from uh, somebody who uh, might have uh, a relatively minor set of uh, issues to somebody who obviously will have more issues. Is, is there any clear indication of where the recruits fit on that spectrum, generally speaking? Perhaps we might start with um, Ms Badenock. Um, of, of, whether, of whether most of them, for example, are what you would characterise as having Asperger's as to a limited or greater extent, or whether there's uh, more, they are further along the autism spectrum. Spectrum. I think with, with this program, it actually varies, but it's, it's generally further along the spectrum. So it is actually um, probably more sort of pronounced sort of variations in the support that, that they, they need, whereas at the lower end of the the spectrum, uh, that's probably where you see more entrance through our standard general recruitment processes. So it will vary, uh, but I would say sort of mid to, mid to higher end of, of the spectrum is what this program is focused on. Um, Ms Lewis? Um, yeah, I would tend to agree that it would be, you know, from me because... Um, it would be more of the mid to um, high in the spectrum um, coming through this program. Um, and as um, Ms. Badnack from Telstra um, alluded to, that um, neurodiverse candidates will come through other ways in the recruitment process. Um, so, you know, there's a availability in regards to them being able to, um, you know, come through the recruitment process in different means. Mr. Nelson? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I think there's a variation in terms of who comes through the Aurora program for us. I think the higher functioning people do tend to just come through normal recruitment processes. Um, but in saying that too, uh, and just to give some confidence that people aren't um, stovepiped, if you like, into a particular role, we've seen a number of, the, of our 11 people already move into higher duties, into different parts of the organisation, into a graduate program, and one's actually left and gone into another part of an another uh, federal government organisation as well. So people do move around and they do get opportunities outside the particular program itself. Thank you. Um, I'll assume uh, in the usual way that uh, none of the represented parties have any questions to ask of uh, the members of the panel who have just given evidence, and I shall pause for just a moment to make sure that's right. That's long enough to pause. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your evidence, uh, Mr. Nelson, Ms. Badnock and Ms. Lewis. Uh, it's been uh, very interesting to hear about the programs that uh, you've each introduced, or at least your companies have. <coughs> and we thank you for your evidence and for the statement you have provided. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett, is there anything else we need to do today? Yes, you're going to tender a whole lot of more, whole lot more documents. I am, Chair, and the only respect in which I'm going to depart from <coughs> the list that's been handed to the Chair is I think that the statement of Ms. Lewis, her being the witness present, ought to go in first with the remaining attachments and the statement of Ms. LePage as attachments to that. Is that a convenient course? Yes, by all means. Uh, in which case, I'd, I'd tender the statement of Ms Lewis at uh, 27 October 2021 as Exhibit 19-12 with the attachments, including the statement of Ms Kerry LePage, marked um, consecutively 19-12.1 through to 19-12.16. Uh, then the statement of Ms Alexandra Badenoch, dated 28 June 2021, to be tendered as... Exhibit 19-13 with the attachments numbering 
19-13.25. through to 19 -13 And then um, a supplementary <laughs> statement of Ms. Badenoch uh, as 19, sorry, dated 25 October 2021 as Exhibit 19.14 and a statement of Mr Michael Nelson of 25 June 2021 as Exhibit 19-15. Yes, the documents uh, to which Ms Bennett has referred will be admitted into evidence and given the exhibit numbers uh, she has indicated and I will initial the document that we call. Um, can I, Chair, I think Ms Wong uh, would seek to say something. Yes, Ms Wong. Yes, it's the case, if I could just indicate, um, that IBM has sought non-publication orders in respect of some of the attachments to the statement, for example, of Ms Lewis and also Ms LePage, which was tendered as a, an attachment to Ms Lewis's statement. Um, we have notified the Commission precisely which documents they are. Yes, I'll just inquire of Ms Bennett. Those have been position. excluded from the list that I have just tendered. So the, the, the documents over which IBM have raised a claim of confidentiality uh, have not been included in the tender. Okay. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I should have asked uh, for the appearances on behalf of IBM and Telstra. So uh, we'll take you as having uh, given your appearance, Ms. Wong. Very grateful. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms. Bennett, is there anything else we need to do today? No, Chair. Um, so we'll resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow and you're about to tell us what will happen tomorrow. Yes, Chair, there'll be a number of panels around uh, adjustments and work health and safety issues, um, starting with the private sector employers at 10 a.m., public sector employers to follow, and in the afternoon, um, we have Safe Work Australia, Work Safe Australia and ComCare giving evidence on a panel. And then finally, uh, Lend Lease and Australia Post will give evidence on a panel uh, in the final session. By that time, we should have worked our way through the entire commercial structure of this country. That, that is the aim, Jeff. Yeah. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. We'll adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow. Royal Commission is adjourned.